Welcome to Saks Realty's Tuesday Night Podcast, where we talk about anything and everything real estate. Each week, we deliver expert information, enabling you to make better informed decisions while keeping more money in your pocket. If you're interested in real estate, this is your show. Wow, we got a live show for you guys tonight, man. I tell you what, here we are with, you know, I, I was kind of kidding with Travis earlier before we came on. And welcome, by the way, guys, to our Tuesday Night Podcast. We're live if you haven't figured it out. Uh, but, you know, Travis and I were just kind of, you know, he was asking me, he's like, Ty, like, you know, how many people do you think are going to be on the show tonight? You know, does everybody know that I'm coming on? Yeah, right. And I said, man, all I did was post <laughs> that Travis would be on the show. My phone was blowing up. My emails are blowing up. I mean, people wanted his personal cell phone number. I'll give it to you later. And uh, I mean, it's just amazing, you know, how much of you guys, I mean, I don't, I don't even think I need to introduce this guy, old Travis Spencer, a real estate mindset, a buddy of mine. Happy to see you here, brother. What's going on? Uh, not a lot, man. That's complete nonsense. And you know it, sir, but I'm going to be 40 this year. So I'll take all the flattery I can get, but there's not a lot going on, man. You know, uh, getting ready to take the channel, my channel to the next level. I'm getting ready to start traveling again around the nation. You know, before I do that, I got to get the home buying course out, free home buying course, had 188 people sign up for it. Uh, and then I'm going to do my drone license. You know, I've been telling you that I got to get the drone out there. I'm going to do my drone license next weekend. You've been so flying a drone without a license? No, no, no. I, uh, I have having to spend money on a drone pilot, actually. But anyways. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> I'm not gonna go it's not like there. anybody's <laughs> listening. This is just us. You can tell me. I mean, I've seen you out there standing on the hood of your truck, flying your drone. I mean, no, sir. Now, now all of a sudden, uh, you what you need a new license for is the one that carries you so that, you know, people aren't attacking you when you're, you know, going to their communities and calling the cops on you and chasing you out. I mean, I've seen the, I've seen the footage, man. I know. I, I'm excited though, Todd. You know, I'm excited. The weather's getting better, but I'm going to, I'm going to basically really emphasize the price cuts and the shadow inventory you know, with new construction. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm going to go out your way as well. No, nope. just Thomas's promises, buddy. I'll believe it when I see it, man. When you show up in the, you know, in the parking lot and hop out, Melissa. Hi. Can you believe this, how it started already this evening? I mean, geez. I know, I know. I, he's being a little misleading with the drone flying, but that's okay. We're super excited to have him back on the show again. Travis Spencer, welcome. And looking forward to hearing what you have to say this evening on what's going on, current situation in the market, and what you're seeing in Texas. And everyone, I'll be fielding your comments and questions to Todd and Travis this evening. But happy to be here on another Tuesday night. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to talk about. And uh, I guess we'll kind of start off with uh, buyers are backing out. I mean, it, you know, it just when I think, you know, look, Travis, you and I have both said for quite some time that the housing market was a wreck and that, uh, you know, it wasn't sustainable and that, you know, I mean, people have been, some people have kind of been knocking on us a little bit, you know, crash bros, things like that, talking about from April, really, of 2022, about how the housing market was showing all of the indications, all the indicators of a housing market crash. And despite the fact that we had 40% year over year or 20% year over year increases, 40% or more in most markets in the US between 21 or really mid 2020 and mid 22 and um you know and now people are starting it's it's interesting because mainstream media is starting to, to wake up to the fact and um i want to dive in a little bit tonight about uh you know some conversations that i've heard as it wraps around uh the fed j pal the chairman and to a lot of people out there that want to think that he's going to pivot uh, I want to kind of address a little bit of that tonight. Don't let me forget, Melissa, because sometimes I say these things and then we get carried away. Uh, but I do want to talk about the Fed tonight sure. um, because um, you know, all, every, all the indications right now are, you know, that the housing crash is in full swing. And, you know, we still hear people that say, not in my neighborhood, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, but it's kind of hard to match house for house. And what we are seeing is that when houses are priced appropriately, they can sell for over list price, but that doesn't mean anything. 
um, as to whether the uh, the price for that particular house would have been more or less a year ago. It would have been more a year ago. I can promise you that uh, because we were seeing complete insanity that we're not seeing now. And Travis, I want to tell you, you know, I think this morning, um, I, I guess really yesterday, it started to really sink in to me or for me uh, because, I mean, you know, a lot of people are saying, Todd, why do you talk about this and like tell people it's not the best time to buy, you know, and, 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 you know, speaking about first time buyers, especially if you've bought before and you've sold before and you know the game and you've got tons of equity and you can afford to lo you know lose money. Uh, but, you know, we've been telling first time buyers a very cautionary time um, and, you know, people, of course, say, why would you do that if your salary, your business success, your surviving this downturn is based on people buying houses? And it's because it needs to be talked about, one. But I think today I actually got up and said, wow, man, this is this is bad. It's probably worse than I expected. Um, Travis, you want to? chime in on that i mean you know i think it can absolutely be worse than we expect what we have going on right now todd as far as like if we were to freeze frame the housing market we have unaffordability that's really strangling americans right now i mean if you look at the stats it's 50 to 60 percent more money right now to purchase a home than it is to rent now places like austin which is about three hours from where i'm at it's over a hundred percent more expensive to own a home. And then also I put out a video tonight when we looked at affordability and we looked at salaries. And then when we compared the salaries to the median uh, sales price house, Todd, based on my calculations, um, and then when we include the $90,000 it would take, about 20% down payment, roughly 13% of Americans can even afford a house right now, a median, a median priced house, Todd. We're not even talking about a luxury house. And then on top of that, add 60 to 70% of Americans living paycheck to paycheck, you know, pretty much all areas of consumer default skyrocketing, maybe minus foreclosures, but the people, you know, at risk of foreclosure is growing. I would estimate maybe, and we've talked about this, maybe 10 to 15 million American households right now are probably upside down uh, in home equity. So there's a lot that, that, that is at play right now, but I don't think it's in the full swing. I don't think the house market crashes in the full swing of things right now. I think that, I think the pain's right around the corner. I think everything that we've seen so far, Todd, um, is the pregame show. I think it's all the pregame show. I don't, you know, and if we look at the yield curve inversions, we see that with the yield curve inversions. We're almost uninverted yet. So there's a bear steepening going on with the yield curve inversions, which is basically saying a lot of pain around the corner you know, with the high elevated interest rates. So I think that, I think we're going to start seeing some fireworks. I understand the, you know, the lack of inventory. I understand those things, but, you know, I think a lot of the premise of the bullish narratives that we're only going to enter a transaction crash. Um, I don't think they're taking into account the health of the consumers and, you know, the unnatural event, which was the money printing and COVID. So I think some very bad stuff is going to happen. And, and you know, I don't want to scare people. But I want people to be prepared. I want people to at least consider maybe make a little bit more money, a little bit more overtime <clears throat> and push pause a little bit. But um, <clears throat> it's been hitting me, Todd. <laughs> you know when it really hit me, man? March of this year. That's when it hit me because uh, what, what, the, what the government did over the weekend with the bank bailout, with the injection of liquidity, that, that to me was like, we're helpless. We're helpless. We're, we're, we're really at the mercy of the Fed. So now I'm starting to think like, hang on, Jerome Powell, you know, keep, keep the, keep the rates high like this, Jerome, keep the rates high like this. So, you know, what do you think about Jerome Powell, Todd? Well, you know, I, I guess we could talk about that now. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, one of the, I, so um, on Thursday, I interview Danielle DiMartino Booth. We're going to release that video on this coming Saturday. So if you guys want to mark your calendars uh, for that, uh, we release at 930 on Saturday morning. And, you know, but diving in, I mean, she wrote a book called Fed Up 
I read the book. It is, <clears throat> it's quite scary. Um, you know, I highly recommend it. It's a, it, it's a, um, you know, it is a, it's a little of a bit of a complex read and, you know, you have to understand, um, you know, when she's right, you know, what she's actually writing about. She was in the Dallas fed, uh, for nine years. And, um, during the time when, you know, we were going through the great financial crisis and when, you know, um, the fed really dropped the overnight trading rate to 0% and to stimulate, you know, the economy and, um, provide free money essentially, uh, to, uh, try and get us back into spending. And it's interesting because, uh, if you follow her and are, I'm, I'm really becoming a fan of, uh, of Danielle and she really kind of explains well, as we get into prior to the pandemic in 2019, we were really in a recession. We were headed into a pretty steep financial crisis in 2019. And then the pandemic happened. And, you know, as a result, here we go again, dropping the Fed rate and, you know, stimulating the economy with money. Um, all of the stimulus and money printing, actually, if you kind of dive into it a little bit, was actually for the global economy, not for the American people. And, you know, when, what, what happened was, you know, with because of us being this world power, it sort of, I guess, kind of falls on, uh, the Fed thinks it falls on our responsibility to bail everybody out. And, you know, by, you know, stimulating our own economy and pumping so much money, more money into the economy in two years than we did in 200 years was really when you dive into it from what I'm researching was to benefit other countries uh, because we are in a worse financial crisis right now than had we even, you know, printed all that money. And when we're looking at, you know, our jobs, our non-farm job growth is actually you know it's declining and you know so i think that what happens is and you're going to hear this in this interview on saturday but basically the fed is relying on labor data that is lagging mm -hmm. you know all, almost a year behind seven eight months behind this labor um you know you know um statistics so what what's happening is we don't have a clear picture and i think when you're reading her book and when we look at jay powell you know i think that we have probably the least qualified and this is terrible to say i don't know who these people are but the least qualified people doing you know the most important work in our um and i'm not referring to jay powell but and company maybe but you know i think they we're really in a mess so now people think that that powell is going to pivot and you know when you listen to some interviews of of friends of jerome powell's they say things like he's getting ready to retire him and biden don't really like each other maybe um you know biden wanted to replace him with somebody else and you know there's probably like this struggle here with you know, Powell's probably going to retire. And how does he want to exit his legacy for the U.S. economy? And if he drops interest rates right now, that would kind of be horrible, even though we probably need it. People that are paying credit card debt and auto loans and want to buy a house, <clears throat> though, you know, mortgage rates don't directly follow the Fed rate, but they kind of mirror, <clears throat> excuse me, mirror each other. But I think that Powell's probably doing the best job that he can with the tools that he has, Travis, in wanting to leave a legacy of trying to, you know, get the country out of this, you know, uh, inflationary time. But I don't know that it's going to work. I think that we're going to have a, 
a crash landing here very soon. I think we're starting to see it show up in small business. People are struggling to pay their bills. Um, I think a lot of layoffs are coming. And uh, I think we're going we're gonna to hear that from Danielle, too. She's going to have some, some great data to back it up. Yeah, man. I mean, I think, I think the issue here, and we saw this during COVID, and it was really depressing. I remember the feeling that it gave me in my heart. Um, they politicized everything, everything, sports, medical stuff that they should never have done, uh, what's <clears> going on in the economy. And the, everything is a political clown show, and it's very depressing. And I'll be honest, Todd. You know, at first, when, you know, when I heard Jerome Powell speak about, you know, the discount window, the bank bailout, you know, it's not really a bailout. At first, I was just upset and I was angry because they promised us they wouldn't do that again because we're the taxpayers. You're not supposed to bail out the elites, bail out the homeowners if it's, if you have to pick. Um, but, you know, I think Jerome Powell is the hero, hopefully is the hero that we need. I want to believe in him more than more than most people know i'm starting to believe in him because he's remained elevated and he's remained firm so uh, imagine todd if they didn't have the two percent inflation goal imagine that so so the fact that he's been in congress he's answering these questions he's keeping everyone as calm as possible so he can continue to boil the economy alive i think it's a i think it has the potential to be a great thing and honestly i think a crash landing is necessary i don't I, the, the whole <clears throat> bust, the bust part, you know, of the boom is normal. It's natural. So when they try to, you know, hide what's naturally supposed to happen and, and bringing the balance back, it's a really horrible thing. And it really hurts homeowners and consumers. It, it hurts them greatly. And, and all this bailing out, all it's doing, man, is getting the rich richer and the poorer poorer. So, you know, I think this one's going to be bad. I think this recession potentially a depression. I think it's going to hit everyone. And I think it's going to hit a lot of elite, a lot of the elites. Um, but then again, I'm also afraid Todd because the bailout, right? What if, what if, if, if there's the only way that price is sustained for a period of time is additional bailout. In my opinion, that's the only way it happens. And they start paying consumers again, depositing money in our checking accounts, paying for my, what was it? Daycare. Wasn't that what they were doing? Remember the daycare or something, unless they're doing that, you can't, you can't put these prices on the backs of the consumers. I have six charts up right now. We talk about PE ratio, talk about payment to income ratio. We can talk about all the reasons why this doesn't work. So I sit back, Todd, and I, and I ask myself, like, Travis, are, are you the one that's stupid? Right? Like, why is no one talking about this, Todd? Well, I do have to ask you the question because... I mean, did you say that the elites were going to, did, what, what did you say about the elites? Did you say the elites are going to feel the pain? I said that some of the upper, like the upper echelon, some of the wall street bulls, some of them, right? Not the upper, upper, like world order I'm talking about the ones under them. I think people are going to get hurt. I don't know that the, like I said, the upper, upper echelon, man, like, like, like I said, dude, they're the ones that are getting bailed out. So I don't think, I think they're going to be fine and get richer. I'm just saying as a consumer, Upper class, yeah. middle class, lower class. Uh, I think, uh, you know, first of all, we're going to have the elite and then everyone else. Um, I don't think the elites are going to get hurt at all. I mean, I, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the, the issue is, you know, um, you know, does your guy get in, right? I mean, it's so come on. I mean, you know, the, these companies seem to find a way to, you know, uh, have a payday. And we learned that in the 2008 crisis when, you know, they picked the winners and the losers. But, I mean, it seemed like, you know, um, I think this one, Travis, is really, this is attacking, you know, uh, middle class and lower class the most. I think that, you know, um, people that have money, they can sustain downturns. Yes. I mean, they, they you know, they can sustain it. I mean, it. You know, when, when you're talking about having a couple million bucks in a bank, you know, what's it going to take a whack out of? I mean, it's, you know, eventually they're going to print more money. They're go, you know, things are going to rebound. But the separation, the divide between the, the wealthy and then everyone else is becoming much greater. And I think the biggest, you know, you have uh, shelter inflation, housing being 30, 40 percent of, you know, of inflation. Right. And CPI. And what happens is those numbers are a bunch of freaking crap 
So 2%, whatever. I mean, it, you know, we know that none of it's 2%. We know none of it's 9%. We know that realistically inflation has been 20, 30, 40%. I mean, all you have to do is go shopping. I mean, I went to Home Depot to buy some plastic bins so I could store some things. And I mean, it was like $25 for, you know, molded injected plastic garbage <laughs> from China. And I mean, it really probably cost a dollar. And, you know, so when we're looking at, I mean, somebody's getting paid, right? And I think a lot of the agenda and a lot of the narratives, uh, you know, I, I had a buddy of mine, I'll, I'll just say this because um, tonight I have a friend of mine who's in the Howard County, uh, I won't say where he is, but anyway, um, he called me up in, in Howard County. We, we have an office in Howard County and he said, man, he goes, what are you doing at six o'clock tonight? And I'm like, well, probably getting ready, ready for my podcast. Why? He said, well, Howard County is going to have like a state of Howard County address with the you know, county executive Calvin Ball. I'm like, why the hell would I want to watch that? <laughs> I mean, what, 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 why? Right. He's like, oh, well, they're dedicating two parks and it's like $30 million are going to build these two parks. And, you know, this company that I'm involved with where, you know, we're probably going to get it or whatever. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, we don't need freaking $30 million in parks. <laughs> right what we need is a reduction in utility bills for people right they can go out in their own yard and play if they had one right they can go i mean whatever right if we are so backwards in everything that we're doing right now it's nauseating we have uh, i don't want to get into it but uh, you know i mean the bottom line is this you know i think that it is a it's a sin what's happening uh, you know, that we are, we printed more money than ever. We gave more stimulus than ever. And people are broker than ever. Does that make sense? i tell you what makes sense. What makes sense is giving money to people and then yanking it back to the rich companies, the elitist, to let them charge more for insurance, to let them charge more for utility cost, to let the government charge more for taxes and property taxes right? Don't pay your property tax. Banks are foreclosing on people's businesses right now because their businesses are up for refinance. Mm -hmm. Their buildings that they have their offices in are up for refinance and they are sending bills that with a balloon payment. I know people that have received them this month to where they need to come up with a lot of money because they are not refinancing these buildings, right? We are, what's happening is we're sucking it right out of the rest of the small businesses and whacking them. It went, and, but yet we're going to build $30 million parks. I mean, we, we're, some, some, something's wrong, man. Something's wrong, buddy. Well, I'd let's say talk about real estate. Let's talk about real estate. All right. Cause I want to talk about what's happening with buyers canceling their contracts, you know? almost feel like you know you ever see like uh i don't know i i used to watch the flintstones when i was a kid man. it was like one of my I watched favorite them, you know yes, what I mean? of course and you got like uh kazoo <laughs> on the shoulder you know you got the little devil that pops up yes. you know part of me wants to go like this you know i want to clap i'm like yay the buyers are in charge right because they have been sucking it for so long. I mean, it's, you know, they've been sidelined, kicked to the curb, mm -hmm. beat out, you know, completely stressed out. Some of these people bought houses that they shouldn't have, money pits. And, you know, now we're hearing like what we've been saying, and it's not that I don't serve sellers too, because I do, right? I'm actually very good at it. And, uh, you know, getting sellers the most I can. I'm sorry, guys, but when you hire me to do a job, I do a job, but, Let's talk about contracts because buyers have realized a real estate contract. Well, look, guys, I'm not an attorney. I'm not trying to advise you. I don't know what your state contracts read. Some of them I do. Some of them I don't. I know what Maryland says. But I'm watching buyers say, screw this contract and screw this seller and come after me. And I don't think I've ever, oh, I don't want to say it yet. But I don't think I've seen where people have gone after the buyer they've maybe gone after their earnest money deposit but let's talk about what's going on i want to pull up this article here if i can find it and joe's going to help me <clears throat> home buyers are backing out of deals at the highest rate in a year 
hey, how about if I say this? How about the last highest rate in the last 30 years, maybe? How about the highest rate that I've ever seen being in business? But we'll just go along with this narrative. Home buyers are backing out of deals at the highest rate in a year, guys, as surging mortgage rates slam the housing market. Duh. People are canceling home deals at the highest rate. As mortgage rates give buyers cold feet. It's not the only thing it gives them. Deal cancellations notched 16.6% .6 in September, according to, I don't even like mention them either, but Redfin, a, a new high since October of last year. We'll get back to the chart. Buyers are extra cautious right now. They want to make sure that they're getting a good deal. I'm going to tell you how to get a good deal. Given how much mortgage payments have gone up when they don't feel like they're getting a good deal. Man, Heather, you are so smart. Current homeowners looking to move also have a tough pill to swallow. I mean, I feel like I'm reading elementary ed or something. <laughs> Um, as many will have to give up lower interest rate they locked in a year ago before mortgage rates shot up. Transactions, guys, are falling apart due to skyrocketing insurance premiums. There's an elite group. That should be criminal. And disagreements between buyers and sellers over necessary repairs. Oh, you know, now these sellers have to fix things. Mm -hmm. Overall, buyers hold a lot of cards right now. That's where Kazoo says, yay. <laughs> and sellers have to give out more concessions, damn it, than to close the deal. Sellers may be more incentivized to close. I mean, look, I, I, I don't, I don't want to read anymore, but I want to go. Let's go back up to the chart. I don't know why this doesn't go back to like 1974, 1968. And I think I know the reason because I've never seen buyers canceling contracts like they are right now. Right? Never yep. seen it. Yep. But let's just look at this. Now, I was there in the COVID-19 pandemic when our governor said that, Todd, you can be, or you are, <laughs> essential personnel. So I remember writing up a whole bunch of letters so we weren't stopped by the police while we were driving down the road with our gloves and masks and body suits to go show houses or at least look at houses via FaceTime. We had the largest that I've ever known of contract cancellations then and now. Mm -hmm. Last year, yes, because interest rates were shooting up for the first time in 15 years. That would shock anybody. And now we're back at it again with contract cancellations. So that's why, in my opinion, you're not seeing, and they're saying the largest contract cancellation since really they should have said the pandemic. I remember, I'm going to tell a little story here because I remember when I had, um, and I do some commercial real estate, and I had a buyer, a client of mine that has invested plenty. And um, we were locked in on this property and we were going through the feasibility period, uh, which is a study period uh, where, you know, we have a couple months. The buyer has a couple months to check out the property and do his due diligence and make sure that he could put a business there that he, that uh, before he buys it. And we were under contract in like um, January <clears throat> and we had, a three-month study period. Well, the pandemic hit, and we were right in the middle of it. Boom. <clears throat> so my client literally lost millions of dollars overnight in the stock market. Oh, Right? And he was like, you know what? I think I want to see if we can get a little bit of a delay on our study period because I don't really know whether I'm going to have any money left. It looks like the whole world's falling apart. It was for a period of time. And uh, let's go to that seller and see if we can get another 90-day extension. Did you believe the audacity of that seller in the middle of a pandem pandemic said, no, we're not going to give you an extension? So you know what my buyer did? He canceled the contract. You know what happened? Fast forward it two years later, the property never sold, and the seller lost the property to foreclosure. Wow. Wow. And my client would have bought it had he just been nice enough and that's the problem. These sellers are getting so cocky. If they would have just been nice enough, 
to give a little bit of leniency. I mean, a transaction is, by the way, between the buyer and seller. And the agents should really stay out of the way sometimes. Travis, are you surprised at contract cancellations? <laughs> I'm surprised they're not higher, to be honest with you. But you know what I am surprised is how, if you really look at the chart that you just showed, and you don't have to show it again, I already remembered it, but it's so unaffordable right now. It stopped home buying as if we were shut down as a country. It's more, it's higher. If I'm not, is it higher? I think it's, 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 it's about the same as if we're in lockdowns. And I'm going to tell you, Todd, people are not canceling their contracts because of good decision making. We're a debt society. Everyone's banking on consumers making poor decisions on spending their money. So banking on consumers getting into debt. Um, I think what we're seeing here is, is the lack of good decisions. I think what we see here is matching the trajectory of the interest rate increases. So I think because over the past few, you know, what, do, what would you say, like three to four weeks? I mean, interest has been skyrocketing. And unfortunately, that's what it takes to calm consumers down. Most consumers, unfortunately, Todd, they don't understand what a good or great deal is. Most consumers are focused on a payment and a payment's important. But if you're only looking at the payment, then you're losing sight of price and fees and sustainability and PE ratio and all of these other things. And I'm telling you, brother, those consumers at 16.3% should be thanking Jerome Powell because they're canceling because their DTI is now too high and they don't qualify for a loan. If it wasn't for those interest rate hikes, that cancellation rate would be lower. And it shouldn't be because the prices are still way overvalued in my, in my opinion. I think the PE ratio right now, Todd, is at 7.4. During the 80s and 70s that everyone wants to talk about, it was in the threes and fours. The PE ratio is in the threes and fours. The, the consumer these days, I just don't, I, I don't, I just think it's so shallow, man. I don't know how it's sustained um, outside of the, the stimulus. Uh, you know, it's an unnatural event that happened. The stimulus and, um, the whole normalizing it is just really, really shocking, man. I mean, it is depressing. And that's one of the reasons why I have that free home buying course. Like I had it and I talked to you about that. I had to do that Todd, for my soul, for my own soul. I, I could, it's hard for me to watch this go on, man. It's really hard for me to watch this go on. So the Melissa? article goes on to say that, uh, Florida cities in Florida were found to have the hardest have been hit hardest by rising deal cancellations in September. Jacksonville, Orlando, Tampa, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, all saw deal cancellations above 20%. I mean, that's one in five. That's pretty staggering. The top, the charts was Atlanta with 24.4. I call that 25. I don't know about you, but that's be one in four <clears throat> contracts fell through. And so I want to kind of talk to that a little bit because there may be buyers that are listening or somebody that wants to buy a house that are listening. And I've said this kind of before on, but I'm going to say it again and apologize for those that have heard me say it. And for you, you new people, um, you know, one of the things that we have to make sure that we're doing is educating buyers on how to deal with their agent, because mm -hmm. we know that a lot of agents, you know, uh, don't know what they're doing. And, um, you know, unfortunately, neither do the buyers and these first time buyers, especially, and they're just following the, their agent right off the cliff. The only difference is the agent has like a tethered strap to them. Um, so they don't fall, uh, where the, you know, buyers keep on going. Okay. And, uh, so they, you know, so we need to be mindful and careful. And what happens a lot of times that we see is that a lot of agents, especially ones that are out of touch with the current market, maybe they sold three houses, but it was three, it was a year ago and they haven't really done many deals now since the market has shifted. So you need to make sure that you have an agent that has done deals this year, preferably in the last couple of months, uh, because that's the most current on what's really going on. Uh, but a lot of people get sucked into this belief that they need to put a bigger deposit down to put a contract in on a house because it makes the seller know that they're serious. Let me tell you something. If you put a contract in on a property, you go through all 187 pages and, you know, 642 signatures and, and, uh, initials used to be nine. Uh, you know, uh, you're pretty serious, right? 
So what happens is, you know, your agent may say stuff like, you're buying a $450,000 house. Let's give them $15,000. That'll really show them you're serious. That's a that that's the wrong advice. Because what happens is if you enter into a contract, the strongest thing the seller has, and I don't know about your contracts and your, you know, the laws in your state, but the strongest thing a seller has is that in Maryland and a lot of other states too, you need two signatures to release your deposit money. And one of them is that pissed off seller that you didn't <laughs> buy the house, right? And if you if you need them to sign that document to get your money back, you could be in trouble if you give a huge deposit, yes. right? It may yes. prevent you from buying a house altogether until you go to court a couple of years from now. So what happens is what I always say is to my clients, I say 1%, you know, so if it's a $400,000 house, let's do a $4,000 deposit, right? Or less. I mean, even 2,500, right? And if, you're, if your agent doesn't want to do that, ask them who they work for and make sure that they you remind them that they work for you, the buyer, at least that's the way it's supposed to work. We'll get into that too, <laughs> because there's a lawsuit going on right now that's well underway and it has to do with who's representing who. And we'll talk about that too. Um, but what I've seen lately is that that's the most a buyer is going to risk. I'm not an attorney. Don't take my legal advice. But the seller would have to really want to sue you pretty hard, um, you know, to take them to court if they backed out. I mean, I'm seeing people back out. Again, I'm not giving you legal advice. But check with your own attorney or your, uh, your agent. Um, but Travis, do you know why these people are canceling their contracts? Other than, other than uh, their exuberance wore off. And they woke up one day and said, wow, I'm going to have a $4,700 a month mortgage payment if I buy this thing. And uh, my rent, $1,700. Do you know, I mean, what are some of the other reasons, Travis, people cancel contracts? Um, well, you know, there could be, a well, what are good reasons is really the question. Like an inspection comes back, foundation repairs. Uh they didn't lock their rate in time and the rates went up again and their payments too high, even though they can afford the house. I mean, conditional property neighbors, but I think most of it is, is the federal reserve. Thank God, man. And just to talk to about what you were saying about that 1% earnest money. I wanted to, you know, you hit my, you always are hitting my soul. Okay. You always hit my soul. I think that's a huge problem paying over 1% because doing that. And, and I think some realtors will take advantage of how the psychology of this works some bad realtors, and, and not all realtors are bad. Uh, I don't want to get roasted in your comment section again, Todd. Uh, but some realtors will do exactly what you said, fit you know, way more than the one percent. I've heard some viewers from my channel say ten percent, fifteen percent. If you guys are putting ten to fifteen percent down as earnest money, you're at the mercy of of the other party. You've lost. If I'm the seller, I'm like this guy lost all the negotiating power. He can't walk away. He's got fifteen thousand dollars tied up. So I think it's I think it's a bit criminal. Now, what we do here in Texas, Todd, uh, pretty much the same thing as you. But when there's an issue, some of the games that they'll play is like if the buyer wants to mess with the seller because the seller's not releasing the earnest money, you have to have the earnest money in escrow removed before you relist the property. So, a lot of times here in Texas, at least a good agent on the buyer side. I'm not saying I'll do it. I'm just saying they'll strong arm the seller back and say, we're not going to assign anything and release the earnest money to you seller. And we're going to keep this locked up. Now they could sue them in small claims court, but you know, it's a problem. And another thing I don't like, and this is, this is a huge thing. I hate it that realtors are at, when did realtors become loan officers? Date, the rate, marry the, when, when do, when do realtors understand how payment works in price? All of these realtors now, I'm saying, especially on YouTube, except you, Todd. Okay. Dude, I hey, only hear that from loan officers, officers, Travis. I'm just saying, man, I'm a great loan officer. It's your and own I can kind you right saying this, man. Your loan officer I crowd is the one that invented <laughs> date the rate. I hate it out loud. so much, but I hear realtors saying the same thing. And you, you like, you trained them. This. I'm trying, man. I'm trying to train you them. You trained them. You trained them to say I, it. I didn't train the ones that I'm training aren't saying that. 
And one of the first things I say, don't say that. Let's bring up an amortization schedule. Let me explain what refinancing, how expensive refinancing really is. If you even qualify, how could you guarantee someone could even qualify? How do you know that they're they're even going to get any equity? You need equity to refinance. You need a job to refinance, right? You have to qualify for that. And these lawsuits, Todd, that's going on with National Association of Realtors, and, and I know you might talk about this a little bit more. I welcome it. I welcome it because think about what they're doing. The lawsuit's about the seller's requirement to pay the buyer's realtor's commission and the buyer realtor negotiates against them. So the seller is paying the other party to negotiate against them. So it's this, the whole thing is really, really crazy. But what if they take that away when now the buyers are even worse shape? If the buyers have, what do you do? What do you do, Todd? How do you fix the problem with realtors? Well, I mean, I, I, I want to get there. <laughs> You're skipping ahead. I'm sorry. I'm still trying to teach buyers how to negotiate their contracts. Now you all, now you want to teach them how they're going to have to pay for their commission checks. <laughs> That's part of the negotiation. I, I, I heard a little story. Maybe you could clear it up. I heard that you loan officers were going to finance them for 30 years, finance their, their commission check. Uh, what? Come on. Are you man. serious? Come on. Who, who did you hear say that? Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac? Who said that? I think you said it, didn't you? I didn't say that. I'm only kidding with you, but somebody <laughs> said it. And it was one of I your, it was one of your, again, it was one of your loan officer comrades, man. Dude, I'm, we, I'm telling we you. We got issues all over. Yeah. LOs, yeah. everyone. There's a lot of issues. Well, sure. there's issues with agents too, but we're going to save the lawsuit for a little bit because I want to okay, get back right. to the contracts because okay. contracts are, that people, Buyers are dropping contracts, man, like hot potatoes. Some say potatoes, some say potato, but they're dropping these things, man. I'm telling you, they're dropping the contracts and the agents are like, what? Seriously? They're like, yeah, I'm not going through with it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm backing out. Mm -hmm. And they're like, agents are like, well, you can't do that. You signed a contract and they're like, okay, want to bet? I'm backing out. I'm not moving forward. I'm not going to settlement. I'm backing out. And there's a couple things. So guys, if you, you know, if you're going to put a house on a contract, I don't want you to get in trouble by canceling the contract without your right. But here in Maryland, and I'm sure you have contracts too, and I want to pick on the contract in Texas. And if I have any Texas agents here, um, you know, you can chime in because you guys really like your sellers in Texas. Uh, you know, because you make the, you make from the contracts that I've seen, and I've seen a couple Texas contracts. Um, you make the buyer pay for a contingency period for crying out freaking loud. If yeah. you want to get an inspection, they got to pony up some money. Yes. You know, and it's like, well, okay, well, here's it. I'm going to play the agent now. Cause that's the role that I play. <laughs> and, and, and I've got my buyer here. And uh, so I'm like, okay, you want Tra Travis, you want to put an offer in on, on this house. That's great. Well, what did you, what, what, what did you want to, to do? Do you, do, did you want some kind of study period or fees about, you know, like a contingency period? Well, what does that mean? Well, like, do you want an inspection and stuff like that? <laughs> well, yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Well, what do you want to give the seller in order to let you have seven day inspection period? I don't want to give the freaking yep. seller nothing. I want to inspect their house because I want to buy it. Is that shenanigans still going on right now? Oh yeah. It's, it, it's usually Todd, uh, $150, depending on the but general, like middle, 150, middle, that's 150, not what I got seven days. 150 500 500 yes that's because you lose the money right if you back out and if, if you back you, out you lose the if money. you don't back out it is credited so that's not very favorable to the buyer is it they go look at three houses they want to do something as simple as get an inspection and they let's just negotiate in the middle here and say it's 300 dollars you do that three times that's a thousand bucks that's more than your home inspection you guys don't do that no mm -hmm. really no, so you guys get the a seller wants inspection? to sell the freaking house and the buyer wants to offer them up. You know, believe me, now I would think that your sellers would be paying the buyers to do the inspection. I mean, I think the, the, the premise is it's not fair for the seller to hang up their property, mortgage payments, blah, 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 blah. So here's $150 you can walk away for any reason. I mean, I, what do you guys do where you're at? How do you not, how do you guys not, not do that? that? What we do is we say, here's the offer, and the buyer wants an inspection, and they say either yes or no. And then what if it comes back 
but the inspection comes back poorly is it grounds to terminate absolutely are really throwing everything but the kitchen sink and we get it or we get out and there's no time for is there a time uh a well, time yeah, you gotta pick a time yeah, but no money is paid frame. no money no. is paid no wow yeah yeah, yeah. and that's the way that's it like should it. be i mean maryland does at least two or three things right that's one of them <laughs> that's one of them uh okay if you guys are buying a house right now, please don't buy a house without a home inspection. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it, this is where I'm seeing the biggest problems with these buyers and really getting into financial trouble. I have a couple of them that I've talked to that recently purchased. They want to sell their house. They're underwater. Uh, they can't sell their house unless they bring cash to the table. Yeah. Um, you know, they, these were sell, uh, buyers that put the bit bare minimum amount down. Uh, but let's get home inspections and let's not be too crazy on the time period. You really have to make sure that you're looking and that you have enough time to get a home inspection and other inspections. I always tell my clients when we're putting in offers that we want, we want to do a structural, you know, a, 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 a typical home inspection and if the house has chimneys, we want a chimney inspection. And, you know, if it has a swimming pool, we want a swimming pool inspection. Uh, you know, you want to bring in a, an electrician nowadays. You want to bring in a, your own heating and air contractor. You can't do all of this in five days or seven days. Um, you know, you should at least have 10 days or 14 days. I like 14-day inspection periods to give enough time. And then there's always a an add-on that I put on the contract. Any other inspection, home inspector feels necessary or suggest a buyer. And that kind of opens up the door to get anybody else in that we need because when we're picking off the boxes, you know, what we want for inspections, we want to make sure that we put like a catch-all that we can get anybody in here. If the home inspector says, hey, get yeah. this checked out, we yeah. want the ability, we reserve the right to get it checked out. And what I want to tell you guys, if you're buying right now and you're going forward right now and you're in that position where you can, you know, and you're negotiating heavy, you're negotiating hard, make sure you have the right agent that will put in as many offers as it takes. It's not going to pressure you or get frustrated with you. And, you know, if it takes 20 offers to get you a deal, they better be willing to write 20 offers or find yourself a new agent. But make sure that you are looking at what you're signing because what we're going to talk about here with the lawsuits is agency and that's where you kind of sign your life away to this agent for a period of time and you know buyer agency is what i'm talking about a contract that says that you get paid and i tell you what travis i think if i'm not mistaken you guys have awful buyer agency contracts too because I don't remember seeing a termination clause in there. And I can remember saying something to an agent. I was helping a client of mine buy a house in Texas. And he was sending me everything and I'm looking at it. And the buyer's agency didn't have a termination period in there. And I questioned the agent and same with Tennessee. And I questioned the agent, like, where is your termination clause in here? What if I don't like you? What exactly. if we don't get along? And the one agent in Tennessee, I was helping a client in Tennessee. And the one agent said, Oh, well, you know, we kind of look, you know, I'm trustworthy and uh, eh, no, you're not. Um, we're not signing a contract that says that there's no termination clause. You need to write one in there, which they did. But guys, if you're buying a house, you need to make sure, look at your buyer agency agreement. Again, I'm not your attorney. I'm not an attorney and I'm not practicing law, but I am telling you to make sure you look at what you're signing and that it says that you can get out. Because if not, you're you're you may as desperate as a lot of these agents are nowadays. You may end up buying two commissions. Yep. You may sign an agency agreement, think that you're getting rid of that agent, go buy a house, and they go, "Oh, that's great. I just want to let you know this is where you can deposit the check into yes. my account from the title company for the commission that you agreed to." So you have to make sure that. It, Todd, this is embarrassing. So I don't know if I should say this. But Your battery's I, getting ready to die or something? I mean, like, come on. What, no, go, go I, I'm shameless about Hit that. Hit us with it. I'm completely shameless about that. But uh, when I was 20, I actually got sued. And I lost in small claims court because of a buyer's rep agreement. 
I was blown away that this guy got away with it. And what happened was, I mean, the, the first property I've ever flipped was in Southern California. I was 20 years old, couldn't even drink. So I was naive, but I was a hustler in mortgage and I was making a whole bunch of money. So I wasn't, I wanted to trust the realtor. I still remember this guy's name. It took me years to get over this, by the way, because I was young and frustrated. So um, he snuck in a freaking buyer's rep when I was signing the final documents and, and it was blank. And I remember asking like, why am I signing this? And he's like, don't worry, we'll, we'll talk about it later or something like that. And I completely forgot about it. So I fixed up the property to flip, made 80 grand on that when I was 20, by the way. And so I list the property. Don't hear anything from this guy the whole time, by the way, right? Don't hear anything, Todd. And six months goes by. I sell the house through another, uh, through another agent. And I get an email from this guy. He's like, hey, I, I, know, she saw, I know she sold the house. When are you going to pay me my commission? And I'm like, what? It, it, Todd, he already made $9,000 off of me from representing me to buy the house. He already made nine grand. But he wanted the other nine grand for me selling it. And he didn't do it. Because he already lick. spent it. He didn't do a lick of effort. So six months goes by. I sell the house. I get the email. And I'm like, dude, kick rocks, right? The only problem was is, you know, back in the day, I was really more energetic, if you will. I wasn't, I, my game plan wasn't as good as it is today where I will smash him in small claims court because he can't, he legally couldn't have done that to me because I have a relationship with the broker. I thought you were going to say you were going to go over and smash him. I did too. Dude, I'm going to be honest with you, but it took me two years not to smash this guy. I mean, I was a young kid, man. I knew where he lived. California is a disclosure state. So obviously I looked up where he lived, but it, it, it took me a while. I, what I'm saying is this, it's, it's really, really important to know what you're signing because those contracts are like bulletproof. They're so binding and, and, and honestly, and that judge, Todd, I'll never forget it. I felt like I came up with a decent case, right? It's just, I didn't hit him like what I would do today. I hit him hard in court. Um, but the judge was like, nah, you lose. And, and my thing was like, this guy did nothing. So the judge asked him, was like, well, um, did you look, did you drive around the area? And then, you know, did you scout the area? And he was like, yeah, sure. Sure. Your honor, you gave me the answer. So he just said yes, and then boom, slammed it down. I had to pay this guy five grand when I was twenty. Did he ask old. you whether you read the contract? I didn't read the contract. I mean, that's what I see. You know, I'm waiting for the next lawsuit. By the way, not for me. I mean, gosh, don't, <laughs> don't get so excited. I mean, jeez. <laughs> oh, he filled my info but, out. By the way, I'm, I'm well, of course he did. Here's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for, and if one of these attorneys are, you know, uh, listening, uh, don't don't call me. Um, <laughs> you know, when we have these electronic signature things now, you know, yes. I mean, when you send out the contract to somebody, and all of a sudden, like thirty seconds later, you get this hundred and fifty-seven page contract all <laughs> yeah. signed up, and you're like, "Whoa, I know. man!" You you're didn't like, read that? Oh, I got an alert on my phone. Bloop, bloop, but yeah. signed. I'm like, yeah. dude, how did you sign that so fast? <laughs> you didn't sign it. You are a freaking speed reader, right? right? Yeah, yeah, you didn't. And, you know, that's why you've got to make sure, you know, that you're telling, and, and I'm very, I put it into the notes, do not sign this. This is what we went over. Don't sign it. If there's something not right, you know, disclosure, 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 and capital letters, don't sign, you know, if there's something wrong or something. Because, you know, it's like amazing. People just sign these contracts so fast. They don't know what they're signing half the time, I, I believe, know, right? I, I mean, not my clients. Have you but, read those lending contracts, Todd? Have you lend, Have you have you read the, the loan disclosures from start to finish? Have you ever done it in your 30-year career? I'm, I'm not answering that. That's self-incriminating. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Because no one reads it. I tried. I try to read it. I, I don't understand what it says. All right, listen. Let's talk about other ways that people get out of contracts. Is it may, maybe I should ask you this for Texas because you've already violated two of my, you know, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I don't agree with paying sellers to get a home inspection, and I sure don't agree with contracts without termination clauses. I but let's talk, huh? Don't blame that on me. I just live here. I didn't write that law. I'm not blaming it on you. I love Texas. Okay. I took it personal. I, I don't know anything about Texas other than these two things. <laughs> How about can they get out because of HOA? Uh, yeah, I think as far as canceling contracts, documents and yeah, like condo docs and stuff. I, 
there's only a handful of, of things like death, a uh, mental capacity. If you go crazy, you can get out. Uh, you're cr if you're crazy, you can get out if you're crazy. Yeah, if you prove all you got to do is crazy, tell people you're crazy. You can. How do you prove if you, that? If you, I don't know. You got to fight in court. Pay thirty grand to fight an attorney fight for you if you want to do that. Um, well, there you go, right. guys. I don't know, man. I don't know about the H. What do you think about what? the H Having a little buyer remorse to make you crazy, huh? Uh, they, they're crazy to buy, to be honest with you. Look here. How about financing contingencies? If the loan can't go through. So here you go, guys. If you yes. want to blow your loan, go out and buy yeah. a brand new okay. car. Go out and mm. rack up some no. debt. Take all your credit cards to the max. Right, no. and that way, way you can get out, and then you just tip your loan okay. officer on it. But three days before the so you, house settles, you say, "Hey, man, me. did you see all the stuff I just bought?" <laughs> he's he's going to incriminate me, Melissa. I'm going to tell huh? you. Okay, fine, fine. If you want to know the little dirty secret, I'll tell you how it works in Texas. It's called a third party financing addendum, and you. Okay, I don't like to talk about this, but the earn. Who cares about the earnest money when you have the third party? To be honest, if you have a third party. Usually our third parties are good for 28 days, okay? And, and third party means if your contingency for financing falls through, you can walk away, you lose your uh, you lose your option fee, but you don't lose your earnest money uh, because of the third party. So here's the thing. If, how do you, put, the thing is, is agents will say that their loan got denied, right? And so they'll say, hey, Travis, can you send me the denial? I'm like, the loan's not denied. Like, what are you talking? Or, or maybe it is denied. But technically you're supposed to give them a, like the only one that can issue a denial for a loan by law, is an underwriter. So in order for an underwriter to do an official denial for a loan, it's not, they can't just do it. They actually have to have been denied. So what people do instead is they give them a letter from, from loan, like saying automated underwriting, loan prospector, DU, and that will say denied. And then a smart loan officer that has a good relationship with the realtor, I'm not saying this is me, of course, will send that because, you know, I mean, I would represent- Hold on, hold on. Let me take my, my headphones. Client. I don't want to hear this. But yes, third party. No, that's how it works, Todd. That's how it works, Todd. Are you done? <laughs> I should be. I should be done. I'm, I'm done with that. But but oh there is my. some little tricks. Okay, ooh, You're the one that pulled ooh, that out of me. I wanted to move on. By man, the way. I'll tell you what, huh? Mm. All right. It's a game. <laughs> Anything else you want to No, I'm done. Up Let's about, move on. Huh? No, sir. Let's take some questions. Do we have any? Let's do let's do that. Let's look at the poll first. So we've got lots of votes here on this. What's going on in your market? Please then please comment where you're from in the chat. We've got a lot of that. But 61, actually 60% of you, 60, 61, is um price reductions. I think I just heard you double. I doubly. Did. That's okay. Hmm. That's all right. All right. Brief moment. And I thought um, I was having hot flashes. The Red Bull's going through my head. Sorry for saying that earlier. I should have just shut my mouth. I'm so sorry. I'm giving huh? hot flashes, Melissa. Say what? Nothing. What? I'll have to play. I was, dude, I was texting you, trying to tell you to stop talking, man. I was Is trying, that what? I mean, oh, oh, my God. I mean, your phone's not vibrating and going off and stuff. I'm trying to send you a text like, dude, uh, no, look, we have to me. take. Look, I've never done that. That's good. Good. I don't know what it is, but that's Psych. good. All right. What do we got in questions? Yeah, we're going to hit the super cash really quick. We got Chris here. I have nothing of value to add. Just love the show and roll tide roll. Uh oh, <laughs> thank you, Chris. Got a little Alabama going on, huh? Yeah. And then we've got another one here in Texas. Almost every home will have some sort of inspection issue you can use to cancel on. Well, thanks. Thank you very much for your thank, super thank cash. You guys, Absolutely. And, and then I do, do want to hit a few of these that um, you guys are chiming in from. We got Randy here saying it truly is. Happy Tuesday. Filled my truck up at three dollars and eight cents a gallon. Where does he live? I don't like, know. Texas. I probably. mean, like, huh? Texas. You yeah, guys have that cheap Texas. gas out there, man. So, sometimes we do. Yeah. Yep. Jeez. And then we've got What's people chiming. Would you find a way to pump it out of the, you know, open the siphon? oil refineries back up? I feel it's no, like 329 right now. I feel that. That's it? I feel it's something like that. It wasn't anything crazy. I don't know. Cali I closed my $5 eyes when I gas. in California. I have a problem filling up my gas. 
I never fill it up the the whole way. You don't have any problem when I'm filling it up. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> Does it give you a gas card, Melissa? Oh, yeah. Because you should. I do a lot of traveling. Yeah. Yeah, good. good. He's a good guy, Todd. Right, she says she has trouble filling. Did you say you had trouble filling up I don't your like car to, I don't like with to... your credit card? Yeah, yeah, with mine. <laughs> yeah, very specific with her credit card. Yours is good, Todd. I heard it. She'll yeah. fill her car up and someone else behind her. A friend I heard it. I heard pulling it. up to the pump. Right, In fact, when I up. come out... Melissa, when I come out to visit you guys, we're going to the gas station. Between you and Melissa, man, I'm learning all kinds of things tonight, man. This is, <laughs> this, I ought to hang around more often. <laughs> we do have um, our viewers checking in from all over our nation. Unfortunately, Los Angeles area homes are mostly selling over asking sometimes 100,000. It's so annoying. We also have here, Boston area is almost all over asking everywhere unless it's very overpriced. So we appreciate you guys letting us know what you're seeing, but we've got a question here. Are you all hearing of second mortgages, HELOCs going into foreclosure, even though the primary mortgage is paid to current? Um, I, if foreclosures right now and defaults are are low. I have, I have a hard time believing someone's going to get, uh, you know, go through the foreclosure process if it's only a second mortgage, unless, it, but how could they have a second mortgage if, if they don't have a first mortgage? So I think it's more, it's either a first mortgage or a HELOC. I have a hard time believing that there's going to be a, you know, a wave of foreclosures for HELOC minus the first mortgage foreclosure. They could just sell the property or, and they don't have to use the HELOC. A HELOC is not a, a loan you get all of the money right away. A HELOC is something you could draw from. So you may not have a payment right away on it and you could pay it back down. So Travis, isn't it, isn't it possible? So they're talking about a primary mortgage here and not paying. So oh, they pay get current. a second, they, 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 they get a second mortgage. They get a home equity line of credit. I know some people that are in a jackpot right now because of this. One of them is an agent friend of mine. She bought a house in Florida. Uh, she lives here in Maryland, decided that it would be a great idea that she had so much equity in her house that she would extract all that equity with a HELOC, a home equity line of credit. Like Travis is saying, that is a loan that they come out, they appraise your house. A lot of the banks don't even charge you for the appraisal. You have to keep the HELOC open for a minimum of like three years. And, you know, then you use it and you pay as you go. The problem with the HELOC is that it is a variable rate that means it adjusts and when the rates go up it goes up right along with it and uh this agent that i know actually bought a house in florida and she ain't very happy right now but the question is here and i think the answer is yes if you're a loan officer real estate attorney you can correct me but i'm rolling with this i think the answer is yes I think that they can foreclose on you with a second mortgage. Can they, Travis? They, they can foreclose on you, yes. I didn't know that was a I mean, you could foreclose on someone for not paying their HOA or for the property taxes. Any encumbrance on a property that goes into default, you know, that's well, what a tax. happens. So, so here's the deal I'm the primary mortgage and I'm 500000 And you are the HELOC and you're 200000 how does it work maybe you don't know but how does it work when melissa doesn't pay you and i have the first position because i'm owed five hundred thousand you're only owed two hundred thousand how can you foreclose on the house and i'm owed five hundred thousand dollars you would have to pay whatever lien was ahead of you so if you're the second mortgage holder, you in order to do that, you would have to have enough equity, it would have to be worth it to take care of the first lien holder. Or as a second lien holder, you communicate with the first lien holder. But you you don't get your money unless whoever's in front of you in that lien order gets paid. So uh, you know, I, I don't know, man. You know, I don't see I see overextended consumers going into for you know, starting to tick up, obviously, but it's hard, it's hard, man. I mean. What do they mean by current? They mean there's still a first mortgage on the property? Is that what they're saying? And it's paid current. Plus, that means mean. it's not past due. It's paid on time. If So, for example, say if there's an equity in the house, you know, their first lien, would you say, is 500000 If there's three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 in equity, then the second lien holder is still going to want to foreclose because then they can sell the house, pay off the first lien holder, and cash in on some equity, potentially. 
But again, I'm not an attorney, though, in real estate law. So I'm sure every situation is unique. This was the mess back in the great financial crisis because the way it worked was that the mortgages weren't being paid and the first position primary mortgage could not foreclose on the property until they negotiated with the oh, second yeah. mortgage or the no home equity. equity line of credit to get rid of them so that they could have full clear title you know, title to move forward with the foreclosure and that's one of the reasons why it took years to get people out of the house interesting you know that's a good point todd he has I been mean, doing this was, a while melissa for a little bit for a minute i don't know how much longer i'm going to do it <laughs> yeah I don't right know, man you love it i tell you what i don't know when i got up this morning man let me tell you what happened back in 2008. Well, I was building houses in 2005. Uh, you guys, some have heard this story before, but I remember waking up on this one morning and I was down in Baltimore in a neighborhood called Hamden. I remember it very, very well. Hamden is in the city and it was going through a massive revital revitalization. It was a really kind of a cool little area in baltimore and they had built this uh mark train and people could get in and out of dc and at that time in 2005 we were getting an enormous amount of people that couldn't afford dc sort of like now and they were coming into baltimore and you know so they like to buy around this mark train and uh and it was kind of a cool little vibe going on and um i remember i the Sunday paper, you know, it was an actual paper that you hold and read, ladies and gentlemen. Boys he and has girls. to specify. It, it was, yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> not like going newspaper, online. It was an actual newspaper. You go and you put, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it was like a dollar and a quarter at this point, uh, you know, to get a paper. And it said across the headlines, I'll never forget it, man, because I remember looking at it like, Across the headlines, it said the overpriced Baltimore housing market. And I was like, okay. From that moment on, that's all everybody talked about. The market was on a downward spiral. This was in 2005. The market still peaked in 2006, which is why yes. I tell you yeah. people, when you say, oh, the market's not going to crash because it's still going up. Yeah. No, it's not. It, it, all the indicators are all across the wall, right? I mean, all you got to do is look around, right? They, we've never had a bubble like this before, but all of a sudden I started like losing money, like fast. People weren't buying houses and giving, well, they were, but they just weren't giving, you know, um, well, the builders were giving deep discounts and so were the sellers, but the agents and I could say this because I didn't actually become a licensed real estate agent until 2005, though my what? career started in housing in 1989. Yeah, yeah, it's truth. I've been an agent longer than Todd. That's possibly. That doesn't mean anything. Possible. Though, yeah, yeah. yeah, right. It's but uh, the bottom line is I've been in the housing market since 1989. <laughs> I mean, I, come on, right. man. Right. But I just didn't want to be an agent. I don't blame you. Back then. I, I'm aware of this. So, you know, so anyway, I was forced into it because of agents, okay? The reason I got my license is because I couldn't take it anymore. I don't know that I can take it anymore now is my point. But anyway, 2006 was the bubble bursting. It wasn't until 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, until we saw the massive fallout. So how could it be that the overpriced Baltimore housing market was advertised in 2005 and the bubble didn't burst until 2006? Because we're looking at backward looking data and sometimes it takes a little while to sink into people that they can't afford what they're doing and that they made some bad mistakes and it takes their peers to actually start to like default on their loan before they realize, geez, uh, I might not be far behind them. And, uh, but this one is a little bit different in my opinion. It's worse. What happened this morning, Todd? 
They got you so spooked. Well, you know, I mean, I I probably got up on the wrong side of the bed, Travis. I, I don't think I ate breakfast. That's important. Oh. Give this man some something to eat. Melissa, he's moody right now. He does fast on occasion. Come on, man. On occasion. Really? Come yes. On. Those are the I don't think it sinks in for Todd. I don't I I think some consumers it's never gonna sink in until it's on their doorstep, quite frankly. Was that a trick question? Was there something that happened this morning? I mean, are we missing something? Yeah, you here? said you said you woke up this morning and it like something hit you, right? Oh you did say that. Ah I see. Forget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I leave I was trying to make it see, I was right. You were you just were. saying that. Did right, say, or let's try and remember. It was like we? a pivotal moment this Should morning. We, I was we so, trying to remember? I was so was drawn it? in. I don't know. I was so drawn in. I wasn't with you this morning. Is that morning. where I started? Like I got up this it morning? Just, well, yes. no, it's just it's just come up. It's been like a little thread through the conversation today. I got up this morning and I said, this is going to be a lot worse than I expected. Mm. I mean, that that's really what it boils down to. I mean, look, I think, okay, you know, I'm doing calls with my agents, you know, I mean, look, I, I got to call the agent and be like, hey, yo, remember me? Like, where you been, man? Like, uh, you know, oh, yeah. like. Uh, it's dead. Stop by the office and see me every now and then. You know what I mean? It's like a, it, it, it started to really kind of settle in when I'm have been talking with a lot of people across the country and i do man i mean i have broker friends across the country agents loan officers title people and when i hear about really how bad it is the problem is is that i don't even think we realize just how bad it is yes yet i think we're starting to get a taste we're starting to get a taste. There are people that need to sell their house. They're starting to get a taste of the change in the market. j Powell, I don't think, is laying off the throttle. I think that another six or nine months, people are counting their checkbook. People are starting. I'm talking to people that are counting their checking account. They're looking at it and say, how many more payments can I make? How long can I sustain mm. this through? How yeah. long can I not make money? People in the industry, right? People in other industries, in the auto industry, in the you name it industry, are starting to wake up to the realization that they're not getting work like they used to. And let me tell you, my friends, what's going to happen. Right now, we got about a million apartments that are coming on the market in the next 12 to 18 months, maybe less than that. When that commercial construction stops, construction is going to fall off the planet because in 12 to 15 and 18 months we are not going to be in a better situation in my opinion travis what do you think you almost got me well i almost said the word triggered but yeah I don't, um I think all we got to do is just listen to what Jerome Powell is saying, Todd. And as long as Jerome Powell sticks to that 2% inflation target, we already know what they've told us. They're doing the, the dot plots. They're, you know, they're saying essentially if depending on who, what fed uh, chair you're listening to, the soonest they're going to cut rates is more than likely the end of next year, which means, and then the other thing is this, even if they start cutting rates, Todd, that doesn't mean they're going to cut rates 100 basis points and that mortgage rates are going to drop to 5% overnight. It's a Travis, process. Two points isn't going to make a bit of difference at all. If people don't if have we a job. Go from, if, we, if we go from you know eight and a half to six and a half, you think people are still going, they have less money in their bank accounts today than they had two years ago. They have more credit card debt. You know what? Now look, I'm a pretty good borrower, right? I mean, you know, if it, on on paper, I mean, I could, I could get a loan, right? You know, I just got a thing in the mail the other day, and I opened it up, and it was my one of my credit cards, and they said, "We got a deal for you. <laughs> We're going to give you twenty four months to." Interest rate. Free interest. 
And if you don't pay it off in 24 months, the interest rate is 34.5%. Mm. Mm. That's it. <laughs> is that legal? <laughs> Apparently. I, I was like, sign me up. I mean, man, there, you know what? There, it's not going to get better, Todd. The, the Jerome Powell said, labor market, crush labor market. And, you, and then when we look at the job numbers, the job growth, if you want to call it growth, it's part-time jobs. We're losing full-time jobs. But nevertheless, <laughs> you're right. The rate cuts, so this is the point I was trying to make. If there's rate cuts, that means something really bad has happened. And if something really bad has happened and there's unhinged unemployment, and then there's a recession, small businesses, you can't get it, you know, even if you can't get a part-time job, it doesn't matter what the rates are. That's why I keep trying to tell my viewers, try to prepare to take the hit. We got to get for, we got to get through the hit and we don't even know what the hit is yet. Everything that we've seen is in the front end of the recession is in the front end of the unhinged unemployment, potential unhinged unemployment. We haven't seen the level and depth of pain yet. We've seen the lack of sustainability through the price declines, uh, really accelerated price declines. And then we've seen the typical bounce back. Only this time, the bounce back, Todd, I think it was very harmful. You know, the bounce back, the dead cat bounce, you know, what, what we see now, obviously values are headed down again. But I think the fact that the there was that bounce back up, it just means that things are going to be that much worse. The reality is, is we need house prices to like start going down in 2021. From 2020. Well, I mean, so, the, thing, the thing is there, Travis, with what you're referring to as the bounce back, I mean, sales were still down 30, yeah, 40% still. in a lot of markets. So it wasn't much of a bounce back. I mean, Just you know, when, yeah, I mean, when, when you look at it and you say, you know, I mean, there isn't a whole lot of transactions going on. So I, I went and saw a seller on last Friday. And, you know, we were kind of talking about, you know, hey, uh, you know, they want to sell their house. They want to move out of state. And they've been there for 30 years. Hmm. And, you know, so we're kind of walking through that. Well, first we started talking about, you know, kind of bringing them up to date on like, what are your expectations? Because the market's kind of bad, you know. And, um, you know, but the crazy thing is, was, you know, they want to sell in the spring, which is a lot of what people are thinking right now. And I think we have such a, we have such a pent up demand for sellers that we don't even realize it. So a lot of sellers that mm -hmm. I've talked with, even beginning of this year, they want to wait this out. They want to ride it out. They think that the rates are going to drop. They think that affordability is going to increase. They think that people are going to get 30, 40% raises um, or that the government's going to start printing money again or something's going to happen that's going to allow them a better chance to sell at a higher price and get another house at a better price or a better rate because their equity is being wiped away right now. And, you know, and that's if they didn't refinance and take out that extra $100,000 to redo their kitchen. But anyway, so we were looking, I'm looking at the house and, you know, the big thing is I have to try and come up with a price, right? I mean, I'm like, I, you know, it's like, oh, gosh. You know, <clears throat> well, here's the problem. The problem is there's nothing to compare it to. So oh, I had to do a polygon of that whole subdivision. And, you know, and I'm looking at it and I'm like, well, in the last six months, there hasn't been any sales. Or really? one. Or wow. one. Yeah, because sales are down. No inventory, yeah. sales are down. So what I am looking at is that sale that was sold was a distressed sale. Now oh, it doesn't mean a it. bad it doesn't mean it's a bad house. It just meant that the people were pushed to sell for whatever reason, whether they were relocating for work, whatever it is. They had to encourage the sale and it closed in um May. This is the problem that we're going to roll into next year when all these houses hit the market. What we're going to see is the only homes that have sold have sold for a lesser price over the next four, five, six months. That's your new comparable. So these sellers are going to be rolling in the spring expecting things to be great. And I think it's going to be homes are going to be priced for less money than they were this year. And I think the discounts are going to go even more from there. And that coupled with that, a lot of these sellers haven't fixed anything. I mean, I'm looking at a house, 30 years old, hasn't had bathroom updates. 
The buyers are going to walk through. They're going to say, I got to spend money in this. And, you know, it, it's going to be a, it, it's, it's going to be a, a hit or miss. We'll see what happens. Well, all it takes, Todd, is three comps. You get three distressed sales in a subdivision, then all of the other houses are dead in the water, especially like what you just said. And I, and I start to understand your point. It's going to work against people. The lack of sales means there's not a lack of comparables. And basically what we're saying is, is the comps, which is a sold property, is what is used to create value for the appraisal. And an appraisal, the appraiser uses three comps. And you have to stay in that subject property subdivision because every subdivision is unique. So they're required, at least in Texas, required. So again, especially if it's a they small want subdivision, three. Todd, you're, you're, at the, I, you're at yeah. the mercy of the comps. So I, you have a great point. And do you think we're going to hit four millions? Do you think we'll be under four million this year for sales transactions? I mean, I think that will be probably around that number. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's That's number low, one. It's, low. you know, first of all, it's hard to get the real numbers. Yes. Um, you know, so it, 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 the bottom line is it's one of the worst years we've had since the great financial crisis. But the biggest thing is, Travis, do you think people are, will be, underwater do you think they're going to owe a lot more on their house than what you know uh than what well, i mean they could sell it for the thing is todd is there's already people there's already people like that and then but i will also say this and you know this it depends on the metro area but everything is in a bubble though right now everything is unaffordable but it depends on the metro area austin if you purchased after say the middle of 2021 you're upside down Overall, it is Phoenix, Las Vegas. There's Dallas now, uh, Houston now, San Antonio now. There's already people underwater. And I know you don't want to use percentages, but let me just say this, okay? To sell your house takes, in Texas, I see 6 to 8% when you count closing costs, okay? Maybe a little less where you live. When you add that to the fact that they already don't have any equity, that means that people, in order to sell their house, if they're in any type of distress, more than likely if the house is, say, $400,000, they may have to bring, Todd, $20,000, $30,000 to close on their house. And if they don't have that, they cannot sell. And there's, I, from my guess, 10 to, 15, 10 to 15 million households right now, upside down, in their house right yeah. now. <clears throat> Let's take some questions and then we'll talk about the lawsuit that's happening and unwinding and how real estate brokerages are starting to change the way that they're doing business already. Um, and uh, New York, one of the first states, we'll talk about that too, but mm -hmm. let's go ahead. What's this Peter Schiff comment? Mm -hmm. Peter right. Schiff keeps mentioning that banks are losing money by holding cheap 3% mortgages. How is that possible if most of the loans are sold to Fannie Mae? Because not all of them are. <clears throat> Todd, not all of them are held by, by Fannie Mae. It's not just Fannie Mae, it's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Ginny Mae, um, which is Gus. You know, because the thing is, the low interest rate mortgages that the regional banks are holding, you can argue are as bad as subprime loans. Well, Fannie they're Mae doesn't buy them. homes, right? I mean, they, no, they, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they don't buy houses, so they're not no, sold they to Fannie money. Mae. They are a, uh, right, they're a government-sponsored entity or enterprise, and basically they insure the loan. So they're not buying the loans, they're insuring the loans. Um, it's not like, you know, uh, FHA or VA um, or, you know, a government-bought, uh, you know, mortgage, right? Yeah, it, right. So FHA, the only one that is guaranteed is, v so VA is guaranteed, FHA insured, by the government, conventional private mortgage insurance. Yeah. Yep. So that's conventional is your Fannie Mae and your Freddie Mac product. No, you could still, I, I ran file, you run files for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac will do VA, FHA. They won't do USDA, but FHA, VA, and conventional. So they'll, they'll buy those loans as well. So it's not, it's not, it's not conducive to just conventional. Well, you're saying right? buying, but you said Fannie Mae doesn't buy loans. Um, no, I'm saying that when you're running underwriting, right? So they have the rules. You know, I, I got to do a little piece on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, man. Um, I'm going to... Well, anyway, well, how are banks losing money at 3%? Well, because what happens is banks were borrowing money at 0% from the Fed, right? So that was, 
that basically it, 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 banks had like a free ride. They could they could make money at three percent. Now when they have to spend like five percent to get money and they're collecting three percent, they're actually losing money on what they've lent out. So right. you know, so so what happens here is that the banks are losing money at a rapid rate. It's not just that, but these regional banks were crushed back on March 12th when, you know, billions of dollars were taken out of regional banks and put in banks like Bank of America, Chase, Wells Fargo, and these bigger, too big to fail banks gobbled up all of this money because everybody was scared to death to lose their money because the FDIC was only insuring up to $250,000 per depositor. And so, you know, that, that, I, I mean, you know, it, it, I have to correct myself real quick. It's very, very important. Um, th this is how I was trying to explain it. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac do buy loans. Okay. But what I was trying to clarify is they don't lend the money to the consumer, right? So it's sold in the secondary market. So like, for example, the, the mortgage company I work for, Todd, they'll lend say $20 million. And as long as it qualifies for the guidelines from Fannie Mae, if that's the underwriting that they ran, and if it's those guidelines, Fannie Mae will buy that loan from us. So they're buying a lot of loans as long as they fit the criteria, the underwriting criteria, but they're not, what I was trying to specify, they're not, cons they're not consumer direct, but they're buying loans. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Ginnie Mae are buying loans for sure in the secondary market as long as it qualifies. But they're not buying like non-QM uh, and things like that. But they're buying conventional FHA and VA. Yeah. All right. Well, we won't, you know, we won't take them down to the Q, you know, non-QM and stuff like that. I mean, look, thanks for that clarification. I am not a loan officer. I'm not a mortgage guy. So appreciate you, Travis, Sorry. for clearing that up. Mm -hmm. Sorry. But I do understand the... Uh, <laughs> I do understand it, lending money for less than what you can borrow it for, and that yeah. certainly doesn't work for the bank. And Peter Schiff is 100% correct. We have a super cash here. Doesn't matter what is happening in the economy, live within or below your means, and you will always be okay and in position if or whenever deals come. Amen to that. We appreciate you, your chat. job. <clears throat> Thank you very you know, much. You know what? I mean, it's... You know, people don't think that the sky is ever going to fall. And that's the, you know, well, you know what? And I think that's part of the problem is that we live in a debt society. I mean, it's like, you know, we don't want to wait for stuff, right? My battery died. He was right, Melissa. <laughs> he knew it was You had to back up that fast. <laughs> yeah, because you warned me in the beginning. Freeze frame. Oh, whoops. That was the wrong button. That was embarrassing. <laughs> He's a mess, huh? Guys, you got to love Travis. You can cruise on over to Real Estate Mindset and give him a subscribe if you haven't already subscribed to his channel. Travis and I, if you can't tell, uh, we're we're good buddies. And, uh, you know, we talk all the time, actually. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I was just on his channel the last two Saturdays. He gets me before I do my pretend workouts on Saturdays. If you look at those videos on his channel, I'm wearing a sweatshirt what's a pretend workout huh what's a pretend workout pretend what means i uh, think about it <laughs> oh okay think about working oh. out. i, I, didn't I don't know actually that do it okay right i, I wave at the equipment say hey how's it going <laughs> i would like to address this question how many agents are you guys seeing getting out of the market it has to be lean out there yeah i mean we're well, updating our database so we just did this um, you know, we, we go, we take all, we have 20, I think 23 counties in Maryland and then the city. So 24, uh, areas that we, um, are, uh, you know, communicating with agents on a pretty much a weekly basis. We send out the, uh, Tuesday podcast to our mailing list and, you know, uh, you know, not counting people that have unsubscribed and stuff like that. There's agents that don't want to hear from us because they don't like what we're saying. Uh, shame on you. Uh, but <laughs> some people like to unsubscribe because they think that too much email is not good for them. I agree with that sometimes. But anyway, I have been seeing in each market 
where um, we're losing, I'd say, based on my downloads, um, it looks like in Maryland, maybe maybe 3,000 of the people that were in our database, uh, regardless of their subscription status, uh, were lost. I don't know. So I've heard some numbers, 60, 70,000. Uh, there has been uh, some experts out of the 1.6 million that we're supposed to have in the United States, somewhere 1.5, 1.6 million. Uh, some people are saying that if the lawsuit is successful, we will lose a million licensees. Some people like Kazoo on the shoulder going, yay. If you didn't, weren't part of the early part of the podcast, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But anyway, um, a lot of people are backing out. They're at least getting jobs, whether they let their license go or not. And that's what you guys have to understand is, again, it's lagging data. Real estate licensees are licensed for two years, renewal periods, right? And a lot of times they've already paid their fee. Their license not up for renewal. We won't start seeing the main attrition until these agents start hitting those renewal periods where they're like, yeah, I'm not going to renew my license or I'm going to put it in inactive status at the real estate commission. So I think right now it's just going to depend on how these lawsuits pan out as to whether, you know, more agents decide to, uh, you know, be uh, something else. Okay. I've seen it, Todd, in, in my market anyways, guys, as, as far as like what I do, because I teach a lot of classes. I'm going to say as far as the enrollment, maybe – one third, like it's real bad. Like one third of the agents are showing up to the office. And then what I'm hearing from the bigger brokerages like Keller Williams, uh, for example, Remax, for, I mean, they're losing uh, top teams like crazy. So, so they're, they're losing the top teams. The top teams are like, we're losing, you know, we're making less money. The grass is greener on the other side. Let's try one ditch, last ditch effort. You know, the usual stuff when the market slows down, the grass green on the other side. So it's happening. And, um, a lot of these brokers are freaking out, Todd, to be honest with you. Well, I'm practicing my cooking skills. I'm going to be a short order cook down at the local I'm giving uh, him the clap, pancake Melissa. shop. There's your clap, Todd. Huh? There's, There's your clap, clap buddy. What, yeah, that I'm going to be a short order cook? <laughs> going to take my show on the road, man, into the I kitchen. Hope you do. Yeah, I'll man. go with you. Nice. Huh? I'll go with you. That sounds good. All right. Do we okay. have any more questions? Yeah, we do. We All have right. we have so many questions. But we're going to do. Um, let's you're reverse. With me. Does that mean you're going to cook too? Uh, you know, I'm just going to. You're going to wait on the table. I'm going to cue it all up for you, huh? so you're prepared. Going to get it all mise en place. Is what we'll do. Um, okay, moving on. We're going to reverse a little bit. Um, you were talking about inspections, and we had some questions about that. What about requesting inspections on new builds? Some of them are falling apart as soon as buyers move into them. We've seen this. Yeah, we've seen it. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you've been to a couple of them too. I, mean, I have. It's, um, absolutely, positively get a inspection on a new construction. Have your independent inspector. But the big thing, guys, is that uh, you can't always listen to your agent when it comes to picking a home inspector. You have to be smart and do your own due diligence. Uh, you need to make sure that the home inspector actually has construction knowledge, not just took a course and, uh, you know, uh, their first day out on the job. Uh, because um, a lot of times when you do these new construction uh, walkthroughs, well, any, it doesn't matter if it's existing home too, but the new builds, uh, a lot of times the superintendents will tag along and kind of, so the agent has to be strong enough to be like, yo, stand outside, man. We don't need you in here pressuring them, you know, everybody as to what's going on. Um, but the important thing is, is that get an inspection because we always find things that are uh you know not right and these builders are pushing you to settle it passes their quality control as they call it and then it also um they get a uno from a building inspector and you know i mean look the building inspector is not looking at that house the same way as a, a, a your independent home inspector will okay yeah the breaker panel may be great and all the outlets are to code and the plumbing and all that stuff will pass and that the framing past the house isn't going to fall down around you um you know but there's so much more to it than that i've seen warped doors windows that are broken 
Um, and the problem is, and what I'm going to tell you guys is make sure that you're getting this stuff fixed before you settle because yes. they will try and push you and push you and push you. And what they say is, hey, you got a year warranty. Everything's good. We can come and do it. Look, I have a client right now that has been disrupted like a half a dozen times. When you're living in a house and you move in and now you have all these contractors coming, tearing things apart, making yep. dust for you in your brand new house, it's not fun. You tell them, no, I'm not settling until these things are done and you do another walkthrough. That's my recommendation. Well, that's a that's a beautiful thing, Todd. I'll add to that if I can, man. Do you remember that interview that I did with uh, Mariah? They purchased a Lennar home. They did not use a realtor and they got no inspections and they moved in. They signed it anyways. They did not they did not have the builder. And and I love these people. And they were, you know, they were brave and they and they told the story. But brother, uh, they got just bamboozled. Once they close, you're dead in the water to these builders. Most of these builders are dead in the water. And not only that, if they would have got an inspection during the end when the home was already built, they, they wouldn't have found too much wrong. But the problem with them is they needed inspections during several stages of the construction, Todd, because there's like water sitting. Basically, when all said and done, their house was leaning, brand new house, two and a half inches from one side of the house to the other. They would pour water on the kitchen countertop and it would go to the other side of the counter. That, that was their home, brand new house. So what did they waited till after they closed? Guess what happened? Construction zone in their house for, I think, a year. I think it was like nine months to a year. So they're breathing in the dust. There's carcinogen. The word, you know, she's got an allergic reaction. There's mold in the house now. Um, dude, they were, uh, they were just in, in, in such bad shape. And the problem is, Todd, is most people don't realize how dangerous it is to go buy a new house by yourself. It's dangerous. They don't have the same rules. They don't have the same regulations. They get away with like, like, you know, RESPA, like we can't steer people, right? Like they don't have these RESPA things. They could say, if you don't use my lender, you don't get the $5,000. We can't say that. You and I can't say that. We'll, we'll get fined. It's a uh, real estate settlement, uh, RESPA, RESPA, real estate settlement procedure act. It's a violation. So I think that if you're going to buy new construction, not only do you need I would, re I would recommend several different stages of inspections, but also you better bring a realtor, a good realtor in with you that understands how to negotiate. Because again, another thing is Todd, once you close, most of these new home builders are putting an arbitration in Texas. Anyways, they put an arbitration agreement and in Florida, they put an arbitration agreement in the special warranty deed. And this is why so many attorneys do not want to represent buyers of new home builders because they have to pierce this really important deed of trust that has the arbitration agreement. First of all, you shouldn't put an arbitration agreement with the deed of trust. You have to well, sign it. Yeah. I mean, they the try to pass it on, Todd, they tried to pass it on to the new owners as well. Yeah. So they sell the house. Someone else buys it. The new owner is like, Hey, this house was poorly built. I'm going to sue you. And then the builder's like, you can't sue us. The original owner signed this special warranty deed with an arbitration agreement. It's a really bad deal. If you don't take care of things before you close, you are at the mercy of greed and corruption, in my opinion. You, you And they don't care about you, man. So I they do, do when you sign the contract, before you sign the contract. Yeah, mm -hmm. They're your best friend. They're really nice. That's why it's a different person that deals with you through the rest of the process, right? And uh, there is a question here dealing with a previously owned home and still talking about inspection. Mm. They go on to say, pull the carpet up. I did after I bought the house, three inches, six feet long cracks in the concrete. I put wood floors in. Could I have sued the owners? How do you know about the floors under the carpet? Mm. They would have three to disclose cracks. it and know it. Yeah, that's they, definitely if, some shift. They would be, Todd, they would be, li the seller's only liable, Todd, if they knew about the damage and they did not disclose it. Is that correct? Well, I mean, you know, I don't know all of the different laws of the states, but we have a latent defect, um, you know, what's called as a latent defect law. And, you know, if the uh, seller, you're correct, if the seller has knowledge, a latent defect are things that a home inspector or home inspection wouldn't, you know, things that they wouldn't pick up. Yes. You know, that's you know, in sight, you know, if somebody's looking for something and this would be one of those things, right? Yeah. But the, yes, the seller would have to have knowledge and have covered that up. 
And here's where, you know, how these kinds of things happen. Sellers talk to their neighbors. And what from what I've seen happen where sellers get caught is they talk to their neighbors because they're buddies. And then when the new buyers move in, yep. the neighbors are like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, they, you know, this seller, yeah, they knew that because, you know, I was talking to them about it. Or a contractor comes out and it just so happens to be the contractor that looked at it before and said, oh, yeah, I, we, they had this problem before. That's really, you know, how these sellers get caught. But it is, other than that, it's hard to prove. How would you know what's underneath your carpet if you didn't put the carpet down or if it yep. happened after that? And, you know, the issue is in like Texas is that you guys have some really bad soils. Yes. And, you know, yes. and so there's either houses that have foundation problems or houses that had foundation problems or houses that will have foundation problems. And a lot of it is you have to irrigate around your house and keep moisture in the ground because if you don't, then that will really, you know, mess up your foundation. And what I've seen in, in Texas is where people actually cover the walls with some type of wall covering to prevent people from seeing the actual cracks in the in the wall. So, you know, um, you know, so you have to be really careful on, you know, on that. So we poll. Oh. Todd, don't you guys have we polls in, in uh, where you're at in the foundation? I mean, we have we poles in brick, things like that. Yes, but I mean, it's you know, I mean, we have basements. You don't have basements. We no, have drain really. systems, so <laughs> you know, um, we have rain gutters. Yeah, I mean, we actually have you know they put drains in French drains around the. I the love house. those, man. Yeah, with some pumps and things like that in our mm -hmm. construction nowadays. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a problem. I mean, these latent defects. You know, we have what's called a disclosure disclaimer in Maryland where the seller doesn't have to disclose all of the things like the age of the roof, the age of the HVAC or the water heater, blah, blah, blah. Um, they could just say they're not going to tell you anything, but they do have to know whether they have to, um, you know, certify that they don't know of any latent defects. Yeah. Uh, something that they would have covered up, right? Um that the that could cause harm either financially or physically uh to the buyers or anybody else involved but uh three inches in concrete is not a stress crack all concrete does crack by the way mm -hmm. there was another um new construction or custom build that um was asked todd what do you think about custom builder who are still asking one million to build do you think custom builder will also get hit next year so uh, custom builder is you know like a like a scattered lot builder in, in most cases which you know you hire a builder you pick a lot or maybe it's a lot with a builder tie-in uh, but it's not like a track builder um or you know like you see like travis was talking about Lennar, uh, where they are essentially track builders. So they have a couple different floor plans. They build the same thing. So a custom house, um, you know, in Maryland can be, you know, you can hire them several different ways. You could do a cost plus uh, for people that have a lot of money uh, and aren't really restrained to bank draws and things like that. If you're building a house for somebody in a million dollar price range, that's really, you're not going to do a cost plus. So uh, the builder is going to give you a price to build your house. And really, with a new construction, it's going to come down to square foot cost um, and, you know, uh, and finishings and things like that. So, you know, here in Maryland, a million dollars is not a whole lot to build a custom house. Um, I don't know where you are in what area. But the big thing right now is just the building materials are so expensive. So though they have come down from when... You know, we were looking at 1,200 a board foot for lumber, uh, which was crazy. We went from 400 a board foot to 1,200 a board foot. Um, and, you know, so costs really skyrocketed and it became cheaper to build a concrete house than a wood frame house for a period of time. Uh, but, but new home construction is very expensive. 
Uh, so if you want to build a custom home and you want to hire a reputable builder, you're going to be at the mercy of whatever they feel like charging you to build a house um, based on what you're looking for. It's a very risky endeavor uh, because, uh, you know, you don't know what you're picking out. I mean, a lot of times the builder sits down with you and says, okay, you know, here's your budget for faucets. Here's your budget for appliances. Here's your budget for flooring. And you're kind of like, okay, well, I have this budget to stay within and people always overspend. And then by the time they get down to it, they're like, we're broke. We're out of money. And now they're out of their bank loan amount. Um, so the builder has to really kind of rein things in if they're not good managers uh, with doing that and walking you through the process, it can be a real nightmare uh, for everybody, including the builder. So, you know, I would say if you're considering building a custom home, you need to really dive into the builder, their financial solvency, because you could pay double for your house. You could have mechanics liens put on your house if they don't pay their subcontractors. Uh, so, you know, more than the upfront cost is everything else that comes with the risk of building a house. And that's why so many people went to new home construction. I mean, track builders, because they were able to go into a neighborhood like Lennar or NVR, whatever, and they were be, could see the product right in front of their eyes yeah. being built. And then they build the house very fast, usually in, you know, uh, three months or less. And it's very quick. We're building a custom home with a, a one-off kind of builder could be a year and a half. You could be screwed. I mean, it could be two years before your house is finished. And when you look at the builder contracts, a lot of them, ha they allow themselves several years to actually build your house. Um, and so that's that's the risk of building um, and wh where these new, you know, track builders, uh, new home builders profited so much because it gave the, the buyer a peace of mind of being able to actually get it done in budget, uh, you know, for a set amount of money. And, but, but here's, here's the the uh the issue with with uh the custom builders you know so many of them go out of business exactly exactly and so many of them go out of business yeah if they go bankrupt you could be dead in the water and that's that's, that's another that's why when you said research the builder make sure their finances are good their insurance is good i can't express how important it is that if people want to do that, they take your advice. Problem is, Todd, is sometimes people don't know until they know. And that's the problem. So, like, you know, I hope they're really holding on to what you said. If you're going to do a custom build, you want to chase a dream, do it. But you better make sure that if they do, if we go into recession, dude, it hits, it's going to hit real estate. It's more than likely, in my opinion, there's a high probability it's going to hit real estate and it's going to hit real estate hard. So, you better pick, be picking the right custom builder. If they go bankrupt, they don't have to finish your project. They could walk away from you and that puts you in a really bad situation, especially you get a commercial loan. I'm sorry, a construction loan, because if they go out of business, you still have your loan obligation. If the builder lags, you, you have an issue with your loan. When you do these construction loans, money is held in escrow and there's certain restrictions. You probably know that, Todd. I mean, you used to build houses, but certain restrictions. And if you don't meet certain timelines, you can get penalized. So it's a real bad deal. And it has ha it's, it's actually even happening right now. There are small construction builders that are going out of business right now and putting people in a very bad situation. Well, one of the biggest problems that we have is a lack of skilled labor. I mean, that's, you know, that that's the real issue. So, I mean, when we're, we're not teaching people how to build things anymore and, you know, a lot of the workers out there are doing jobs that they're not good at. Uh, their quality control is down, um, you know, and so things are taking two and three times longer to get done and they're all chasing checks. You know, when you're dealing with subcontractors, I mean, they're, like I said, they're chasing checks. So when a builder, I mean, you're not typically seeing a builder building your whole house. They are a general contractor and they use subcontractors. So, you, you know, if the siding guy doesn't show up, and your siding is sitting there on the job because the siding job, you know, contractor went somewhere else because it was a dollar more, you know, uh, per square foot or per square or, you know, $50, $100 more per square of siding. You know, now all of a sudden the builder's like, well, 
I mean, my, my siding guy didn't show up or, you know, now I got to try and find another siding guy. And now this was siding guys more expensive. So it's putting all the pieces together. That's so risky. Um, but that's why we've seen the quality control come down on these new construction, you know, new home sites, because we just don't have the, the, uh, the people qualified to do it. Mm -hmm. There yep. is a, um, a loan question here, Travis, I'm going to send this Ugh. one over to you. What are the cons of refinancing? I, I feel like, I feel like you guys are giving me easy, easy questions. Um, I'm going to say the biggest. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, appreciate the question. Let me just say this. First of all, when you hear Mary, what is it? Mary, the, the, the house date, the right. First of all, the con is, is you have to qualify credit income assets. But the biggest disadvantage of refinancing, okay, the biggest by far, is you start the amortization schedule all over again. People like don't understand when they get a mortgage, especially the first five years of that mortgage, your payments, almost all of it, almost all of it goes towards your interest. It's not mortgages are not like car loans, where car loan, an equal amount of principal and interest is paid on every single payment. Mortgages, no, they figured out a way that you get them rich before you pay your principal. So again, the first five years, I think it's like you only pay like 10% of your principal in, in your payment. So in a put in perspective, Todd, like if, if I take the average loan amount, like say 328,000 with the average interest rate, if you want to pay five years of your loan, say that your mortgage payment is $2,400 a month. Okay. That's what, like $25,000 a year. If you want to pay five years of your mortgage off on a normal home, Cost sixteen thousand dollars to pay off five years. Six, you pay sixteen to seventeen thousand dollars on your amortization schedule. You save five years on your loan. So this is what I want to say about refinancing. It's generally a horrible, horrible, horrible idea unless either you're getting money to make money and you know you can make money, or you're shortening the term. If you shorten the term, okay, refinance. But if if all you're doing to refinance, you get you want ten thousand dollars. Fifteen thousand dollars. You're you're just you're just trapping yourself. You're just becoming a, a debt. You know, imprisoning yourself in mm -hmm. debt. It's really really important people understand the damage of refinancing your house, man. I mean, it is so bad in in many situations. Travis, you know, and I think this is the this is the part that drives me nuts about when uh, a loan officer says date the rate. Um, at what point? Because there's a lot of cons, in my opinion. One is you're repaying transfer and recordation fees, you know, or recording fees, right? So, I mean, there's a cost to that. You're paying loan origination fees all over yep. again, yep. right? So, you're whatever that mortgage company is going to charge you in origination fees, commissions, whatever. Um, the other thing is you're repaying an appraisal fee. Yes, the other part is if you're going to refinance your house and your value is dropped, now you need to bring more money to the table because you don't qualify for the entire mortgage amount uh, that you maybe you're paying right now, right? So let's just say you have a mortgage for $400,000 and to refinance, they say, well, that's great, but we'll give you three seventy. dollars Now mm -hmm. you need to pay your, your origination fees, your recording fees, your appraisal fee, and another $30,000 out of pocket to refinance your house. None of this is, I mean, maybe some people say, hey, you date the rate, but I just want to let you know it's going to cost you a fortune to refinance yeah. later. And others will say, if you ask them, like, and pull it out of them, like, what makes sense to refinance, like a half a point, a percentage point? If it drops to 6% from 7%, should I refinance then? You know, like, wh at what is the breaking point? Now, they may say to you, hey, yeah, yeah, that sounds good because they want to sell you on a refinance. But what, Travis, is the magic number that makes it the most sense other than them staying there for 30 more years? The, I, you know what? I used to be a rookie as well and say there was a magic, a magic number. Um, but there's no magic number, man. I mean, you got to look at your amortization schedule. The, the magic number is your term, not necessarily your rate. If you're going from a 25-year right. loan to a 15-year, let, let me put it another way. 
All right, we're using a 30-year amortization, okay? And the people bought two years ago. That's it, just two years ago. Okay. So they're not far into their amortization schedule. They're not extending it that yes. far. They're going to get it. They're going to extend it another two years to refinance. No big deal. At what point is the point? Do, do what percentage point is it better at that point? Because that's not going to apply. But at what point do the fees, the additional fees, justify making a refinance? If you want to look at it as a fee thing, you got to go. Okay. No, no, no. So An interest in, in the rate mortgage, drop. In the mortgage. What rate the, drop would make sense? In the mortgage industry, we have what we used to do and we should train by as a five year break even rule. So if your payment goes down uh, you know, enough to justify the closing costs in five years, Todd, then it's ju justifiable plus the 1%. Okay. So All usually right. the loan officers are saying if your rate goes down 1%, and you get the money back in that's savings. That's a lot, Travis. That would need to be a lot for it to make sense. Exactly. So what do you say to all these loan officers that are saying, date the rate, if you don't buy now, you're never going to, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. I don't say anything to them, man. I don't want to be around them. I mean, it drives them crazy. It drives me absolutely, it drives me bonkers, man. I mean, you got to, you got, as a loan officer, you have to understand what you're doing to people. If they refund, you got to understand the amortization schedule, man. The amortization schedule is killing people and they don't even realize it. In five years, I pay my mortgage down $16,000. That's it. So I'm making payments for five years. And I only pay, again, this is today's numbers, $16,000. So I understand your justification. They only paying for two years. It just depends on everyone's situation. Maybe there's a divorce. They got to cash out, pay off their spouse. I mean, there's many reasons. But then it doesn't matter overall, what the rate is. Dude, overall, I don't think people should be refinancing. Uh, yeah. But- Ooh, if if maybe go. if they're saying four or five hundred dollars, uh, I mean it's it's every eight the rate for years. the next thirty years. It's a unique thing. It's Just don't unique. marry it. They're marrying it, brother. I'm about to marry you, it. If you're upside down. You're, you're married. marrying that rate. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're married. You're married mm -hmm. to that rate. All right, I, let's take a couple more questions because I do want to cover this lawsuit real quick. Mm -hmm. We'll take this and one I know right it's here. It's getting late, man. Travis is just getting ready for dinner in Texas. We're getting ready for bed. Mm -hmm. I want to sell my house now, then buy a new house in a year or so. Where's the best place to park the money? I'm, my money's in T bill. My money's when I see this hurts. kind of question come up on like a comment in one of my videos, I, I wait for the next over the next. 30 seconds, like 18 other people say, call Mrs. Jones, call, call Barry. <laughs> oh, so yeah. And, so, and yeah. <laughs> they, they telegram, telegraph number, blah, 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 yeah, blah, blah, all too. the bots yeah. start 117 likes all of a sudden in 30 seconds. I'm looking at it. I made 15,000 like, <laughs> 15, right. That's it. Yeah. Despite the economic hardship. Yeah. I, yeah. Know, yeah. Maybe 15, I see that all the time. <laughs> right. Um, I got more, right, more treasuries is what I'm doing. Yeah. Okay. Best place to park the money. I don't know. How about we do this one? How bad will the market be in a year? What market? <laughs> the housing market. market? We'll assume the housing mm -hmm. market. I mean, the we, job market, housing market. Housing market. Housing market. Housing market. Do mm -hmm. that one. Mm -hmm. Man, I tell you what. I think, uh, man, I hate saying it. Travis. I think we're in for a really rough road. For how long, Todd? Two years? Only a little bit? Wall Street going to come? Buy everything? How long are we going to be in you this You know, it scenario? depends on whether we're going to see more stimulus or more bailouts, whether we're going to save the rest of the world because the world economy isn't doing very good right now. Uh, you know, so I think uh, the, the uh, I don't know. I, 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 I don't even know. Watch Saturday's video with uh, with Danielle DiMartino Booth. It's going to be a great interview that uh, I have scheduled here on Thursday, and we're going to launch it on Saturday. She was she's very smart, and yeah. she's going to have a lot to say about where we are in the current market. I mean, you know, if you listen to a lot of the economists that aren't uh, working for companies that have 
special interest to tell you otherwise, most of them will tell you we're in pretty bad shape. Are you going to ask her about the Fed put? I, I'm going to ask her a lot, brother. I got <laughs> you know. I like her premise on the Fed put. It's going to be action packed. Let's just say that. It's always action packed with Todd. It is. All right, let's look at the lawsuits. How about it? Before we get out of here. All right. So first thing I'd like to say here is, um, you know, I mean, this lawsuit is under full swing. Uh, you know, this is in its second week. Um, live updates. This is one of our publications. Inman save you the the uh, a lot of the gore, but Gary Keller has been on the on the stand. Uh, you know, Remax uh, declined. They they're one of the ones that uh, they just settled out. Um, but you, we've had uh, people for um, Berkshire uh, Home Services that have taken the stand, and there's a lot of mudslinging that's going back and forth right now, and they're basically talking about citing, um, you know, uh, NAR's position, and you know, NAR saying that they don't really tell the local boards what to do or how to behave and things like that. That they just kind of write the. Uh, um, the code of conduct for agents. Let's actually, Joe, pull pull that up a minute. Um, I want to kind of focus <laughs> on. I, I know it's really <laughs> scary, isn't it? What are we doing, Joe? One, uh, I think, is Article One. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so there is a code of conduct that agents are supposed to uh, sort of be sworn to oath for uh, on how they treat clients and things like that. And the big thing right now that is coming into, uh, you know, the, with this case is how commissions are paid. And, you know, for years, over a hundred years, uh, you know, the seller offers up a commission. And since I think it was 1996, uh, when buyer agency came into play, the seller would pay the broker a commission to list their house, and then the broker would in turn offer up compensation to the buyer's broker, or would just for keeping it in layman terms, the buyer's agent would get paid based on the fee that the seller is paying the listing broker. And the problem with this court case is that they're saying, um, you know, that really it's an unfair practice the way things are being done, because like Travis said earlier, the seller is paying a commission that a part goes to the buyer's agent that directly negotiates against them. And the, the sellers are saying, hey, that's not fair. And then what we're seeing is a lot of the buyers are coming to the table at the settlement table, and they thought that their agent was free because the agent didn't actually tell them that they were going to be making $25,000 on their transaction until the settlement comes and so nar takes the stand and they basically start talking about the um the only thing that they really do is you know put out these um you know um ethics that the agent should be following and making sure that they're being fair to their clients and article one here says when representing a buyer seller landlord tenant or other client as an agent Realtors, which the only way to become a realtor is to be a part of the National Association of Realtors. That is a, you know, a trademark uh, that, uh, you know, when you hear the term realtors, you have to be a, a member of the National Association of Realtors. But anyway, the realtors pledge themselves to protect and promote the interest of their client. This obligation to the client is primary, but it does not relieve realtors of their obligations to treat all parties honestly. When serving a buyer, seller, landlord, tenant, or other party in a non-agency capacity. So I just want to kind of explain that a minute. So what they're saying here is that the agents are supposed to be taking care of their clients. Well, a lot of the buyers don't feel that their agent was taking care of them when they were buying over the last three years and telling them or advising them to waive their rights to inspections and yep. overpaying higher than appraised value in many situations. But when what they're talking about here 
is really the listing agent in the transaction, even when they're not representing the buyer, so they're working for the seller, they have to treat them fairly, honestly, with care, things like that. This is coming into question because a lot of people don't feel like they had care, honesty, representation, and all these things. It's not a requirement, Todd. I mean, it's a duty. That, that's the first problem. Why isn't it a requirement? I mean, I mean, seriously, man, this is this is nonsense. This is to save face. I mean, the, the damage is done. The people have already closed. This is nonsense, what we're looking at Well, here. the state says it is a requirement. Huh. Well, they're not so enforcing this, it. The state is not the National Association of Realtors. And the big problem right now is that the state, at least in Maryland, is we have to provide care to non-represented people, which means I owe them timeliness. I owe them honesty, right? I, if I know something that's a material fact, I have to disclose it despite whether my seller wants me to or not, right? So th there, there is the element there that I can't lie to them, right? And, you know, but anyway, so that's what NAR is saying, you know, hey, look, that's one of the big things that we do. Article three, realtors shall cooperate. And this is the big, this is where they really got them on the, the stand here and the lawsuit, the premise of the lawsuit. Realtors acting, realtors shall cooperate, <laughs> shall cooperate with other brokerages, except when cooperation is not in their client's best interest. What the heck does that mean? The obligation to cooperate does not include the obligation to share commissions. What does yeah. that mean? fees or otherwise compensate another broker now they're saying that well, they didn't say that you have to commission share nonsense hmm. travis That's weren't nonsense. you an agent are you an agent i'm a licensed agent yep i have been for i think almost uh, 20 years Let's look at Article 12 that they're quoting in this lawsuit. Realtors shall be honest and truthful in their real estate communications and shall present the true picture in their advertising, marketing, and other representation. Realtors shall ensure that their status as a real estate as real estate professionals is readily apparent in their advertising, marketing, and other representations, and that the recipients of all real estate communications are or have been notified that those communications are from a real estate professional. What does that mean? They got to be honest and communicate. Let them, everyone know that they're representing and they're realtors. I mean, what does this mean to you? Well, here's the issue. The issue is, will buyers have right to representation? Or are they going to be willing to pay for it? So we oh. know what real estate agents are supposed to be. Right, we're supposed to be fiduciaries. We're supposed to care about our clients. We're supposed to care about everybody that's involved in a transaction. We're not supposed to, you know, act in our own uh, to our own benefit above our clients, right? But here's what the what everybody's kind of scared of here. Um, you know, the buyers and sellers are kind of like, okay, well, now that we opened up this 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 box, what is that going to mean moving forward? Here we are right here, the real estate board in New York already ahead of this lawsuit in the finding of the facts, whether the plaintiffs are successful or not, that the real estate board of New York now will require sellers to directly pay buyer's agent. Starting January 1, listing brokers will no longer be able to pay buyer agents under the real estate board in New York rules. So what this means, I mean, this is a big thing, right? So now if you're going to sell your house here in New York, you are going to negotiate. And by the way, all commissions are negotiable. Yes. There is no standard fee. There's no flat, you know, typical average, whatever, despite what you've been told before, they should be negotiable. But here's what's happening now. You're going to have a seller in, in, in New York in this case the way that it appears is that a seller is going to negotiate with their listing broker, how much they're going to pay them to put the house on the market. Then the seller is going to decide how much they're going to pay a buyer's agent to come and show the house and present offers and things like that. 
I don't know what you all think about that. Maybe you all say that it's the best thing ever. I think what's going to happen if you're selling a house, you're going to say, well, hmm. Now, the question is, I was talking to an agent. They're like, yeah, what a, the buyer's agent's really screwed here, huh? And I said, yeah, <laughs> both agents. so fast. Yeah. The listing agent may be more screwed than the buyer's agent <laughs> yeah, because exactly. the seller may decide that the buyer's agent's more important than the listing <laughs> agent. They do have the buyer. Right. I mean, come on. They've got the buyer that's going to come and bring them the check for the house. <laughs> so, you know, I've had a couple conversations with agents. I'm like, look, I don't think this is going to go quite the way that you think it is. Because the saying in real estate over years has been list the last, right? List the last. If you want to live, you know, last in the real estate business, you got to represent the sellers. I don't know. Hey, man, the, the seller may say, I'm willing to pay the buyer's agent more than you. What are you going to do for me other than put the house on the MLS? And in an environment of short inventory, they may not be too far off. Do you think it's a good change, Todd? Or do you think this is a bad change? You know, why? Um, the way things have been done um, over the years, I do understand it. Here's the problem. And I think that this is going to be, I don't think that this is going to solve the problem. I think that a lot of buyer's agents, I won't say all, but I think that human nature, uh, buyer's agents are looking at commissions, right? Yeah. And, and, and this is the problem, right? If they say, okay, this person's going to pay me more money than this person. How do you, how does one, I, I know how I handle it. I put my client before my own needs. And that's a fact. And Melissa will tell you that, not just because she works for me, but that's just the way we run our business. Mm -hmm. But the issue here is, is that human nature says I'm going to show a house that's going to pay me more money. And if I have a buyer influence, there's the potential that oh, yeah. you can discredit a particular property and yep. push them to another property if the buyer doesn't know how much you're making until the settlement table. Now, if the buyer knows up front what all the commissions are, they may be able to say, wait, wait a minute. Why are you swaying me away from this one? I really like this house. Are you swaying me away because it's you're getting more money over here? But the problem is, is the buyers haven't known this. They didn't know what the agent was getting paid in a lot of cases. They didn't know what their buyer's agent was making until after they went to the settlement table. So I think that there needs to be more transparency all around. You know, I think that people should be looking at houses completely different. Looking at it as like, what do I need to do to the house within the next 10 years? And how much is that going to cost? Because I got to figure that into a reserve study, you know, kind of do like a reserve study. What's the house going to cost me over 10 years? But we're not doing transparency in this industry the way that I feel that we should. A way I really think it should be done, Travis, is I think that the buyer should pay the buyer's agent their commission and the seller should pay their seller's agent the commission. I think it should be split. Now, one would say, well, how will the buyer afford that? It's like anything else right? You're going to need to consider that in the cost of doing business, but it's going to make the buyers really choose wisely when it comes to having representation. Hmm. They're not just going to go with somebody because they went to high school with them, right? It's going to change the playing field. That's the way I think it should be done. Sellers pay your seller agent, buyers pay your buyer agent. It's clean. Nobody's it's the way it is. And guess what? Everybody gets a fair shake. Everybody shops the best representation and make sure that their agents are doing the right job. I think you're missing, I think one more ingredient. We need one more ingredient in that plan. You need to give access to MLS to the public. If the public has access to MLS, it's game over. Everything changes. But if the public does not have access to that backend information, then what could they learn? They can't learn anything that you need. To well, date. they're getting it, Travis. They're getting it. I mean, Redfin's end. publishing. Everybody's mm -hmm. now publishing buyer commissions. Really? But mm -hmm. yeah, but they don't need it if this is the case. 
if if the, if the public pays their own, if the buyers and sellers pay their own commission, you don't need access to the back end of the commission because it's transparent. A buyer but, knows what they're paying if they have an agent. A seller knows what they're paying if they have an agent. The rest is is public record, tax the seller, records, though, prior the, sales, the sellers, days on the market. Everything else is sellers. sellers can't list on MLS without being having access and being a member of MLS, right? So if you give if you give the seller the ability to list MLS without being a realtor, okay, why can't they? They can do a for sale by owner. There's tons of sites out there for that. But, Zillow but has for sale by owner. Does MLS list for Fusbo? They don't. List well, you're Fusbo. talking about you're talking about the realtor owned MLS. No, but these right. other internet sites certainly do. Zillow. Here's the thing. And, and and this is what I tell agents all the time. If you think you're going to open up a website and expect that your buyers are going to visit your website versus Zillow, ain't happening. <laughs> I mean, the buyers already picked the houses, Travis, most of them. I mean, come on. You don't have to set somebody up on the MLS. Over the last several years, this is the way it's worked. Would you please show me this house over on 123 Main Street that I saw on Zillow? Yeah, I hear you. Agents Texas weren't buying. The buyers are finding their houses online. The issue for me is like a big thing for MLS, Todd, is uh, because I love the numbers, so do you, is the comps. So the problem becomes as the state policy. Like for California, it's good. It's public. Everything's public information. For, but for states like Texas, where I live, being that it's a non disclosure state, you know, a lot of times you can't even get comp data unless it's MLS. Like you go on Zillow right now. You can't see what homes sold for in Texas. Sure you can. Yeah, sure you can. You can do a you can do a sold. You can do a polygon. You can do a polygon search. Share my screen. Yep. Share my screen. I'll show you. All right. Let me go to Zillow. I'll show you. So you go to Zillow, right? Because you can use Zillow kind of like MLS, except like in places like um, Texas. Let me go to Houston. Okay. Look at how how crazy it is. I like it a little bit, but when you go to um, sold right here. Okay, you hit sold, right? This is Zillow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I'm in Texas. Texas is non-disclosure. There's no sales prices. See? You can't get sales prices in Texas. You can in California. Okay, do a polygon. Let's boil this down a little bit. Do, do, go ahead and select a polygon, and let's zoom in on some of these things. Because Okay. I'm, well, it's I'm, on the right here, so the yeah. list is here anyways, but I'll zoom in. Yeah. We'll go. Nothing. Right. You get nothing in Texas. So if Nothing. you click on that listing, this one, on one of those listings, it's not going to give me a sold price. Nope, just sold on. Uh, hold on, where's the public record? There's, it's not public record in Texas. You got no public record in Texas. Now let me go to California. I'll show you. When I go to California, everything's there. Let's go to Irvine. Look at see, see Todd, see all the Crazy. prices are there. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Texas shut you down. I huh. blew me away when I first moved well, here. Well, there that goes along with paying sellers to do a, a home inspection and no termination clauses on your buyer agency. It's they got they, they man, it's such a problem. This Ooh. is why you need such people like you. If we could just yeah. clone So, Todd so what us. happens is yeah, I mean, look, I think so to answer your question, I think that that's coming. I think that one of the things is, you know, that they're finding with these uh, antitrust lawsuits or the allegations is that we're not being transparent and we're preventing competitiveness, right? And if you don't use a realtor, then you're di at a disadvantage. Well, you should be able to use a real estate agent who's not a realtor, but then the agent doesn't have, and that's the difference. You have a real estate agent or a realtor. An agent, real estate agent, doesn't have access to... The MLS, that's the problem yeah. now, or lockboxes or anything else. Anyway, we got to wrap it up, brother. We got, man, we were two hours and 20 minutes into this thing, and uh, my staff is going to enjoy this. Huh? We're going to enjoy stay this. Here tonight at this point. We're staying all night? Yeah, we're just going to stay here tonight. We're going to sleep the third floor. Do you guys have three floors? We sure do. What's on the third floor? Our beds. <laughs> What's on the second floor? Oh man, this I can't. I can't disclose that. With. I'm sorry. That's okay. classified. You're classified.
All right, guys, we love you. We appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for spending your Tuesday night with us. Travis, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. It's always a pleasure, Todd. I really, really enjoy these talks. And, and thank you as well, Melissa. I enjoy this. Thank very you. Much. Thank you. And we do it's... expect to see your car pull into the parking lot here shortly. You promise. Oh, that's I'll be driving to you. All right. We'll see. For it. Sure. We'll see it. Cruise on over to Travis. If you haven't already done so, you can subscribe to his channel. And guys, if you haven't subscribed to us, please consider doing so now. Share this information with your friends. Don't keep it all to yourself because half the things, if more or more, you're not going to hear anywhere else because nobody's telling you this stuff. So um, stay tuned. Saturday, guys that don't know us, we post on Thursday evenings and Saturday mornings as well as our Tuesday night podcast. Um, so, you know, check it out, stay a while, subscribe. If you like this video, you got something from it, hit the thumbs up. Let Travis and Melissa and I know that you did. We appreciate you, mm -hmm. Melissa. Another great show, Todd and Travis. Thank you. And thank you to all our viewers this evening. Always a pleasure. And until next week. See you next time. See you next time.